No strings attached? No strings? Hey, we're recording. <laughs> Good morning, this is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for June 25th, 2016, 2018. Whoa, whoa is right. <laughs> we'll begin with a special order calendar, decision items, actually one uh, decision item from the zoning calendar, item number one, 3114 BZ, 165 Spencer Street, Brooklyn. At long last, we have a revised letter that is specific to the site, to the school, and its safety within the district, which was the concern, the environmental concern. And I just wanted to check with Tracy that in terms of that, the vapor barrier, which we talked about a really long time ago, there's um, no need for some kind of a condition about maintaining a vapor barrier. That was a, an old conversation. So, okay, so. So you, we don't have to decide what it is right now, but um, we should phrase whatever that yeah, language is. We reference the DEP the uh, in the resolution. Yes. And yeah. if it's, it could be a condition, because I don't think they've installed the paper. I'm not sure, but yeah. I don't think they have. This was something we talked about, I saw in my notes from like April of 2015. Yeah, I think it was before I started. Yes. So if, if you, we could just dig up that letter to make yeah, sure so the council problem. has it. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks. Item number two, 169.98BC, 3141 Bailey Avenue, the Bronx. Okay, so, um, sorry, sorry. They submitted um, updated photos showing planting and paving. Um, and then they said that they're awaiting new ones because the tenant didn't appear to know what a curb was, so didn't install curbs along the planting beds. But it's not really for the, it's the owner to explain to the tenant what to do, not the other way around. It's Apparently the there's a little bit of confusion about who's responsibility. Yeah, clearly, but if, if all three of them were there at the same time. To get, anyway. So, um, so they're going to be doing that, and hopefully they'll have installed. He said he'll curves. have uh, pitches for us tomorrow. Yeah, if they are in fact ready. Yeah. Continued hearing items. Item number three, four thirteen fifty BZ, six ninety one East one hundred forty ninth Street, the Bronx. Okay, and that one, the applicant provided um, consumer affairs parking lot license. It's valid until March of twenty nineteen. They also provided a printout, and I, then I went on to the biz website to show that they filed, as we requested, an alteration type one to amend the C of O, and the intention of it was to show the parking lot, which is an as of right use in the district. But instead, the way it describes it is, it says accessory parking for more than five cars, and then it says, which it's not, because it's public parking, and then, um, it also describes the reason for it as a request for a denial from DOB to obtain BSA approvals to obtain a service station special permit 73-211. So this is a variant site. So um, somebody didn't speak to their expediter and actually tell them what they needed to do. So the filing is really incorrect. And what we were trying to do is get that parking lot legalized on the CO, cleared up so that BSA in future never has to think about what that thing is again, even though it's on the same zoning law. So, um, yeah. Item number four, 101 BC, 6898 East Burnside Avenue, the Bronx. Okay. The applicant provided records from the BSA file. That was mm -hmm. really good. Yeah that shows that the parking area was always intended to be rented on a monthly basis to residents, actually a an apartment building right nearby. Um, they provided a much better proof of continuity of use in the form of rent payments connected with leases. And the payments went year by year, so I thought that was super helpful. Um, they provided, um, because we were concerned about the retail uses and whether they would really need the parking, they provided a transportation mode survey, um, which they actually conducted by asking patrons in the stores how they got to the stores. And at peak lunch hour, 
um, but not lunch hour, the kind of the range of lunch hours, like 12 o'clock till 1.30 or 2. Um, they had up to 10 to 11 people who drove and parked. So those people would have to find on-street parking not available in the parking lot, which I didn't really find to be like an overwhelming impact on the parking mm -hmm. system. Um, uh, photos did show that they planted the embankment with um, Arbor Vide. Hopefully they'll be able to withstand a rain like we had last night. Um, so, and the fences were replaced because they were in really bad shape. Any other? No. I, I was satisfied with the, all the documentations. Okay. Everybody yeah. else? Okay. <coughs> Item number five, 4006 BZ, 10 Hanover Square, Manhattan. This is administratively adjourned yeah. due to late submission. Item number five. I'm sorry, number six, sorry, new cases, 53032BZ, 1029 Brighton Beach Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application and of notice of hearing to officials. We don't have the community board recommendation. Um, they sent us an email that they don't have comments yet, but we'll reconvene in September to consider the application. This application was submitted in March. So yeah, I, I tried to reach out to them. I didn't, get a, yeah, I didn't get a phone call it back. It sounds like they opted just not to hear it, really. I mean, well, they, ultimately. Well, they closed for the summer. Some community boards right, closed. Right, this was filed. I know, was it was way They ago. received this in March. They yeah. had until end of May, let's just say, to convene, right? So this is a legalization of a conversion from a Youth Group 9 banquet hall to a Youth Group 6 supermarket and from two apartments in the building to offices. The only issue that I have really with respect to this conversion is whether there is more need now for parking since supermarkets sometimes, arguably, have higher parking demands. Banquet halls obviously have high parking demands, but at a different kind of time periods. So um, I think that should be something that they look at. Um, but I do want to say that if this had been an as of right conversion, had this been already a banquet hall as of right, um, a use group nine, nine conforming use can be converted to use group six under 5234 and the reparking requirements aren't implicated, although the loading birth requirements would be if this was as of right. Um, and then, and also enlargements would be, so enlargements, the office being converted from residential would implicate parking, but it's only 20 something hundred square feet, so I doubt it creates parking space even then. Um, so, so, yeah, that's what I, I, I was questioning. Do we need then a parking space? Because the portion that is not as of right is that small portion of the supermarket that's in just the residential and not in the commercial because the rest of the supermarket is in the commercial overlay and that would be permitted as of right. No, no, so, so it goes like this. So the, um, after the district boundary line moved, right. the board essentially accepted that it had waived the right for a theater, which that's what it was right. back in the day, yeah. right? And then the theater converted to the banquet hall right. in part, right. right? And so then, so it's only the theater area, I mean, sorry, the banquet hall area that's converting to supermarket. Right. So that's not a large, it's not um, expanding the, the commercial area. It's only the, it's the same area. But it's, it's those two little apartments that, that are kind of in a funny location in the middle of the building that are converting from residential, which was an as of right use, to a commercial use. So that's the amendment. Right. No, 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 no. I, I, I fully okay. get the history of it. I guess the question with regards to the parking for the supermarket, my question is, so the supermarket which replaced the banquet, the this portion of the banquet slash supermarket slash theater, historically, uh, right now most of it is is in the R6 with the C overlay. Right. With a small portion of, which would be permitted as of right. A supermarket would be permitted in that C overlay. Yes, as of right. in the C overlay. The yeah. only portion where this would not be permitted is in the pure R6 portion. Right. 
and so why are, my question is are we then asking for a parking analysis for the entire supermarket when a very small portion of the supermarket uh, is in the I R6 see. the rest of it is in the as of right portion of the zoning I see so you're saying because because it sort of got legalized by the change in zoning right for a portion of it right most right. of it actually it didn't get legalized the, the the business district was much bigger at the beginning so it got unlegalized mm -hmm. right right sorry as of right it as of right it, it got yeah. unas of right it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a new term <laughs> so okay for, for me, what it, what it is, is the original grant was for a very, very small area, right? Then when the zoning district boundary moved, the board just sort of accepted, what are you going to do, the zoning district boundary moved. And so, um, so the scope of the waiver didn't change, right? So you, you could even argue that the, that the waiver goes all, um, yeah. Goes to the end of the lot line, yes. which exceeds which leads into what would be where a non commercial use would not uh, be permitted be permitted. Yeah. I mean that that's what I would think because mm -hmm. the change in zoning was in nineteen sixty one. Yeah. So this has been in existence from before to after. Yeah. Probably the only thing you would talk about would be the apartment they would generate a parking Park, requirement because uh, that's the only yeah. newly but commercial space of, but right no no because now they're turned into commercial space so that's okay. actually a new waiver right that's and you would so maybe apply a parking requirement to that because it's new mm -hmm. space but then it's under 10 any what is it like five to be required small, right. or it's something. only 2000 or something like yeah. that yeah yeah. yeah, so it no, made. I was looking at if the board had already considered the theater, which it did, mm -hmm. and considered whatever parking aspects there were back in 1930, whatever year that was, um, and then it later considered the supermarket, not the supermarket, the banquet hall. hall. Mm -hmm. um, it, it arguably <coughs> looked at parking impacts of the banquet right. hall when it was discussing it. Now, my only issue is by allowing the supermarket conversion might there be a parking impact that needs to be addressed is that something we look at this that's kind of up for discussion is that something we look at or we say but if it had been an as of right conversion use group nine use group six parking's not implicated right so if zoning thinks it's not shouldn't be implicated I'm thinking why why should we think it should be implicated that you know somehow or other in nine to six wasn't viewed as a problem even when you were going for something like a supermarket um, as opposed to a restaurant because it actually does implicate restaurants in some districts so right mm -hmm. okay so anyway that's something that the applicant should talk about okay oh yeah Move on. Mm -hmm. Item number 7, 5501 BZ, 568 Broadway, Manhattan. We have proof of service of initial application and proof of notice of hearing to officials. Um, they, the applicant posted notice of hearing in the lobby. Uh, community board recommends approval. I didn't find DOI in the folder. I thought I saw it and then I didn't see it. Is there it. a reason for DOI? Was there a change of operators? Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a proposal to change the operator, even though it's an LLC that's what I'm not really sure how this works so bliss is the current operator they're going to be switching to an LLC that is solely owned by bliss it's the same operator. So they don't really exist yet I guess I don't know the whether the LLC. so it's effectively the same operator under a different aka sort of or DBA. if the principles if the principles haven't changed then why right it's the same sole member yeah. Yes, they want to make clear that this organ, this comp this LLC OSW. Okay, so now yeah, I don't know that DOI. They're not going to turn up anything because I don't think it exists or it's operating yet. Yes. Okay, so I need questionnaires. Do you have the question? Did you submit the questionnaires? 
All right, I'll check on this. Okay. I'll see what happens. I don't really know if we need that, but okay. I, I just had uh, one comment. Um, the licenses that are that were submitted into mm -hmm. the file, some of the uh, licenses have expired. I know. Okay. All right, I'll print them out. And the, the request is also to amend the hours of operation. Right. Extend it to Sunday. Right. But the community board was fine okay. with it, and they posted in the lobby, right. so... Yeah. If, and we didn't get any submissions from neighbors. Okay. I just wanted to. Okay. Okay. I'll see when I get back. I email those to Ed and we'll see if we can get it. Okay. okay. To do it quickly, though, because I don't see a reason to hold, to hold this up yeah. just because they go from name A to name B, but it's the same entity, really. That's a, not legal entity, but persons. Okay. Yeah. Persons who could commit heinous acts. They, they would have to get all their licenses under the corporate name as well. Oh, no, no, the massage licenses are personal. Personal to the masseur. Masseurs. Okay. Item number 8, 25413BZ, 2881 Nostrand Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay, we have proof of notice of hearing to officials, but I actually didn't find proof of service of the initial application to officials, so we need to... Chase that, that was around. Email. That was submitted last week. I don't think it made it up into SharePoint. Uh, okay. So, yeah. um, but we do have community board approval, so obviously it was noticed um, or served. Um, so this is about um, an elevator overrun that um, is 23 feet high, which is over one half the height of the entire building, and um, I've seen you know, this whole issue about access to the roof deck where it creates these disproportionately high overruns either, because um, when I was on Landmarks, this came up a lot, and either you use a different elevator mechanism so you're not using that type that has such a high overrun, or you use an individual one-stop elevator just to service the roof. Um, so, I mean, I don't disagree that you should have, obviously you should have handicapped accessibility, um, but I note that, um, and, and I think that the, it, this thing is really enormous, it's going to have a big impact on the neighborhood, especially the people to the rear, because it's now at the, it's pushed to the back of the building. Um, and the originally approved plans didn't show the rooftop as being accessible at all, and, um, and many other waivers were sought, so they never um, raised this as a quality housing Thing needing a waiver. Well, let's stay away from the quality. Of right, for that's the, the thing. Right, because it doesn't apply to this district no, at not. all. No, right, not. this is a this is a non-contextual district. It, right. I mean, quality quality housing only applies from R six and above. Oh, the zoning district yes. that oh, oh. is being zoning Good district point. that is being proposed. Well, the zoning is R two. Yes. Okay. Even let alone the underlying zoning, whatever it was built at the FAR. And any of the anal uh, any of the resolutions that I read of the past didn't refer to that it is being built similar to a quality housing. There was no reference of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And and so there there is no way to make that connection, and therefore say big quality housing requires it. And if it did, then the plans definitely would have had to show a rooftop with right. an access and whatever activities that would have to be done. Um, I, I'm not comfortable making that connection. Yes, I agree with you. If it so, I didn't realize this. I didn't make that connection. I mean that you don't have quality housing higher than an lower than an R6. But that was the, that's the argument they're giving that we must right. So clearly they mustn't. Must. And if they've been re rejected by DOB because they must, because that's the implication. The building is already built. Right, and the implication is they're not able to get sign off from DOB because they need to get, um, they need to have access to the roof, but not if it's not a quality housing building. First of all, the underlying zoning it does it does not fall in that quality housing thing. Second of all, if even if DSA had said, okay, you're going to build, we're going to allow this waiver, provided you built it pursuant to quality housing, that's not there in the resolution. So right. I'm not sure where DOB is making that a requirement. And it may Other not be. I don't right. think they would, mm -hmm. because they would just go by whatever the what BSA grant have? is. Yeah. They're not going to second guess it or question right. it. They figure, right. okay, BSA grant is out of our hands. Right. right. So right. the question is, is this an amenity 
now that they want to provide to enhance the attractiveness that they had not discussed before. Uh, and if it is, then I, it, we shouldn't should analyze be, yeah, it, it shouldn't be considered unless you're going to now mm -hmm. re reopen the findings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's how I would review it. And okay. yes, it's good to have uh, have an elevator access there. You, you would need it for not for just service, for uh, recreational purposes, AD access, but also for any service purposes. No, you don't. Need it. No, 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 you don't no, need just it for service purposes. Heavy bulk stuff. I'm just going to say you know, Yeah. That's not the necessary. But then we should analyze it and review the rooftop and, and see what the design, what the programming of that is, and in, include that into the financial. Right, because uh, a very high bulkhead, I'm not sure we would have approved back then because I remember a lot of conversation about the small homes in the rear yes. and the impact on the character of the neighborhood for those small the homes in the reduced. rear. Yes, yeah, so I, I can't imagine that we would have considered that at the time. Mm -hmm. I think the approach is really slightly different from what has been presented. Yes, that I the very important thing to both of you. Um, the also um, the architect's letter states the building is nearly ready for occupancy. It looks like it from the mm -hmm. outside, yeah, right? So I'm a little confused about that because the elevator doesn't usually goes in before the windows or at least at the same time. The guys are installing the windows, the other guys are installing the elevator, right? So I'd like, what is the status of that installation? You know, too bad if you've ordered the equipment. These are shop drawings that were referred to by the architect. Shop drawings indicate not yet fabricated, right? I don't remember the bulkhead being higher than what is already built to. From my side, because I'm trying to visualize. Well, maybe you. It's possible yeah. that when you're I right up, you see won't it see from it. the street. I, saw, I was trying rear. to see it from the rear, and you can see the bulkhead, but I can Again, it, mm. it's difficult to scale it, but I don't remember it being super high. But I think it would be helpful mm. if they can provide some yeah, we don't graphics from the rear, yeah. because most of the photographs that we submitted into the file, it's only from the front, mm. and the impact is more to the rear, and they should provide photos from the rear right, of the right. site. I was looking at my... But I don't see... If, if they're just doing this as an amenity and they want this as an amenity, implicating findings, et cetera, but then it can easily be a one-stop oh, elevator. Oh, shit. There's no Sorry. reason for such a big bulk. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Oh, it's not. It's yeah. not. Right. It, you can tell that that's the 10-foot bulkhead that, that's the bulk yeah, yeah, that yeah, there was it before. The original pass yeah. to them? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, just the oh. just lighting. The north direction is not in the plans, and the section IDs are missing too. So the okay. Repeat. The sections are missing. The north direction. North direction. On the plans, and the section IDs are not there. And the section. IDs. Oh, okay. Sectional indicator. Okay. Appeals calendar, decision items, item number 9, 2017-320-BZY, 428-432 East 58th Street, Manhattan. I think there might have been a submission this morning, but the record is closed. So, um, so as far as I know, no other submissions were made on this vesting application since the hearing on um, June 19th, and we have heard the testimony on both sides. I stated at the last hearing that the board doesn't have doesn't now have the authority to look behind the validity mm -hmm. of after hours permits and street closure permits where the issuing agencies stand by the valid validity of those permits and the permits were never challenged at the time of issuance or within a short time of issuance. The record shows that excavation was completed and foundations were substantially completed on November 30th, 2017 and that under section 11-331 the project vested under the then applicable zoning regulations and a building permit should be renewed to allow 100% completion of foundations within six months. That's measured from 11-30-17 until the construction was halted, halted under DOB direction and then picking up again from the date of this decision. 
So there was, I don't know, two months, and then they get another, I'm just estimating, but something like two months, and then they get another four months to fully complete foundations. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on this? Okay. I'd like to say that I believe that there is Speak presumption. Speak louder, please. I believe that there's a presumption that the permits are valid. I, don't, I do not believe that they raised a significant objection to overcome that presumption. Um, and looking at what was their, their, how much of the foundation was done and what dates and times the work was, even if those permits, it seems like even if those, we don't count the work done during those permits that are in question, they still would have been substantial, it, it still would have substantial. Well, it depends on which permits you're talking right. about, yeah. right? Street closure was the one that they, they, re they eliminated the 18th and the 30th, I guess, was the street closure permits, but 18th and something else. Um, but there's also the after hours permits, which were on many different days. We have, I don't believe we've taken those apart to find out. Yeah. I don't think we should say there's a presumption yeah. because yes. I yes. think right. it's yeah. been fully vetted yes. by the issuing agencies and they have determined yes. those permits to be valid. At, at least from our side, it's not an assumption. We, we contacted the right. DOT and, and they indicated that these permits so I would so have to say it's more, it's not a presumption, it's a reliance on the statement by the agent issuing agency that the permits are valid. And unless someone can test their validity, and then we have all the facts with which we can dig deep into permitting processes and how those specific permits were issued and all of that, we don't look behind it, right? And so investing cases, which we see a lot of, right, they're there is always the question to DOB, was this a validly issued permit, right? DOB says yes, we, we take that. And in this case, there was also the after the uh, street closure, DOT said yes, we take <coughs> that. It's different when somebody at the, within that administrative review period contests the validity of the permits, then we need stacks and stacks of factual information. What is the agency basing its issuance are on? What, what were the conditions that were, what, was, what information was provided by the applicant, et cetera, et cetera. So we weren't presented with any of um, that at the time at which we should have been presented, which was within something like 30 days mm -hmm. of the issuance of the, of the permits, right? Which it sounds like the community was aware of. Mm -hmm. They knew the streets were closed. They knew there were after-hours work um, that was ongoing. So it seems like that's when they should have gone to DOB and said, hey, what are you guys doing issuing those permits after hours? They, they knew it was like a building 65 story to be, and, and, and actually the enactment of the new zoning or the zoning change was too late to, to like prevent that kind of gigantic tower in the area. They, they, I believe that the, the main reason that this project is vested is because the action from the beginning was kind of slow. I don't know from which side, from the community, from whoever, but it took them too long to like put <coughs> this zoning change in action and, and that. Well, that's really not, it's not relevant to, it's, it's, it's to us, right? Yeah. We're just looking at, Facts, yes, because the, the fact is zoning changes happen for all kinds of reasons, initiated from all different places, and then there are projects that are caught in it somehow in their construction process. That's all we look at. We look at how far, what's the investment effectively of the owner into something that relies on that, that permit. Um, and, and that's all. So it doesn't matter who got where first or wherever, it's whether or not the work was completed prior to the zoning change. That, that's all the... No, I'm, I'm just, I'm not mentioning this for, I mentioned this for future cases if... if no, 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 but that's we're not, not giving finding. advice to yeah. anybody about how to, <coughs> because, you know, rushes, people <coughs> rushing to do things are on all sides. Right. So, um, okay. All right. I, uh, continued hearing items. Item number 10, 10215 a 1088 Rossville Avenue, Staten Island. Sorry. Um, we have DEP sign-off, but this is something mysterious. We still don't have DOT sign-off. This is building in the bed of a map street. I'll reach um, that. I'll do it again today. So I, I, I'm 
not really understanding it. So there's an exist, and the other part of this what's so confusing. There's an existing house. The existing house and the same structure are in the same place. So um, unless there's a proposal to condemn the house to widen the street, and do you, do you recently improve that street? You recently repaved it and uh, provide built a new sidewalk. So. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like they were fully aware of it. if they wanted to, they would have done it. They didn't. So I. Yeah. So this was something where I had asked that you send them a note that we're going to decide on this tomorrow. I had because we. I don't know how much tomorrow. Both messages. I left both yeah. messages and but everything you, saying you we wanted to close this call. out. Left. We wanted to close this out on Tuesday, and that yeah, we okay. needed a letter. So this again is today. a situation that's so confusing because because there's an existing building. It's different when it's a vacant lot <coughs> and we don't know and we see that, oh my God, it could make an incredible extension of the street system. There's a house there that's been there. All they're doing is enlarging the house vertically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Okay. I'll try again. Item number 11, 2016-4253A, 565 St. John's Place, Brooklyn. We received no submission. Right. So this is, um, we warned them, actually. And we sent a letter. Yeah, we sent them a, a dismissal warning letter, <coughs> um, and we received nothing, unless anyone found something. So tomorrow we will vote on this one way or the other, either a determination or a dismissal for failure to prosecute. Um, we only had one hearing ever on this. Um, we had four adjournments, um, five five adjournments, I guess. Can I? Um, there was a submission made on uh, April 28th, and I know we administratively adjourned it because it was not submitted in a timely manner. And uh, I was of the understanding at the next hearing, which is today's hearing, we would be basing a determination decisions based on the 428 submission. That's, then that means we're making a decision as right. opposed to a dismissal, right? Which I think, by the way, is the right way to go because this is that strange yeah. site where there we're asking for vested rights yeah. and the plans don't look anything like what was built. What, when did you see a decision in April? Because this is a submission. In April. A submission. I see April 2017. There was... Um, I have something that's dated 428. Is was in 2017. 2017. Not 2018. 2018. Yeah, 2017. Yeah, I, I also I was going to go uh, back and look. Yeah. So, but I don't think. Any, so what we were told over this time was they were meeting with DOB. Right. And I, I'm kind of curious, like, what are they yeah, meeting with DOB it. about? It's a legal structure. Yeah. It it, yeah. <laughs> right. so if you want to, if you call that curable error, well, then go ahead and cure it, and then have a conversation with us, right? But at the moment, there's this structure that looks nothing like the drawings. So I think it's pretty clear that what they were intending to build wasn't what they intended, mm -hmm. they, they wanted to vest for, right? So, yes, yeah, so, you know, that's interesting about these cases that go on and on, where you need to put the year in your notes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> when it's. I, and I don't think we had a hearing on 420. <laughs> No, yeah, we, the, the, April 31st. the last the hearing 31st. was was February 28th, and then it was adjourned on right. May 16th, 2017. 4:30th right. was because I have after that the, my notes says 4:30th nothing was submitted. 5:51 at DOB, and then we had scheduled it for hearing. Uh, and 5:01 we said dismissal warning to be sent, and then which we did. And then the next hearing was scheduled, which is tomorrow. Right. So that's why I'm. All right, we'll, we'll check we'll the check. file so everybody can the file. I just loaded just the look. file on this morning. I just opened that. It is 2017. Okay. And it was probably one of those later initial submissions that should have been factored into the application initial hearing folder. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I didn't see anything new from them, but I, I saw something that caught my eye. I want to put it on the record. I saw a letter from the structural engineer talking oh. about two scary things and, and I just want to put them yes I want to put them on the record just in case if they are listening or if the if the DOB is, is listening to us hey I saw two I saw two letters one from the from the structure engineer that that in that these two letters the structure engineer is referring to a wall that need bracing he didn't mention which wall is that 
I'm not sure if this wall is braced or not. If it's not and it's a safety issue, please somebody should take care of this. The, the second thing, and it was actually weird, okay. uh, in, in, in a letter from the structure engineer, he's sending this to whom it may concern, I guess, and he's saying that the building could support two additional, actually he said two new floors. I believe he meant two additional floors. That building was like an addition of two stories. Yes. On top of the existing. It so was an existing building that yes, was being and enlarged. They two they added on top two of stories. Yes. I'm not sure. Th this thing, this letter should have been issued at the very beginning. I'm not sure if, if it was concerns raised about the capacity of this building, whether it could take two additional floors or not. But sending that kind of letter at this stage, it was sent at, like Ray's skeptic, uh, skepticism from my side that this building could really take two additional stories. So if, if the DOB has something in their files, please take a look at it. Anybody is involved with the, with this kind of construction, with this specific building, please make sure that but this building... But I believe building buildings, uh, Commissioner, I believe buildings in this, we had we have buildings go out there and inspect yeah. the site. So, yeah, because there was a, vac a vacate of the one of the tenants in the yeah, rear. Yeah, that, that's... One of the that's tenants my, in the tenants that's in the concern, rear. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. When, when, you, when you see construction started and then issues was raised that oh, the floor, this building, like the floor is sagging, it's sinking, and then all of a sudden the structure engineer issue a letter like this, no, 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 the building is good, it can take two additional floors. Then it's, it, it caught my eye. And I, why are you issuing this letter that late? It mm -hmm. should have been issued at the very beginning, not now, control. not control after engineer. the fact. So, so one of the things that we had asked way back then was since the building was built larger in floor plate than it was allowed to be, it was penetrating a side yard and a front yard setback, we asked if you're going to actually remove that illegal construction, what's, can you do it without basically demolishing the entire addition? Right? right? That was a question that we posed, but I don't think they ever responded to that. Um, so, because the 428 submission, I, I don't actually, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that they ever responded to that question. No. But I know that so, we did think, we did send out DOB inspectors on it though. Did yeah. You, Marjorie? Yeah. Well, we did because we were so confused. Why does this I was look concerning why like I was like, picture? what was going on with the building? Then mm -hmm. we, we sent it to, um, here um, what was that curtain? The tenants, some tenant thing that just to make sure why the tenants vacated. Because one tenant was vacated because the rear, there was an obstruction mm -hmm. for egress, I think. Mm -hmm. And there were some other things going on. And then the inspector, there's, the violation should be in there, I think. Mm hmm. Okay. About there was holes in the floor, there was whatever, mm -hmm. more maintenance. The, the letter I'm talking about is dated 11-8-2016, uh, <coughs> so I, I Oh, it so it must be in an early no, beginning initial I don't think submission. it was a response to the board. Okay. 11-8-2016. Structural plans? No. Structure then. engineer statement. Yes. That's the one. Yes. Oh, I see it. I see it. I see it. Okay. So this is it with the initial submission then. It's just a three line. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, Usually a statement, 8, a statement like this should have gone to the DOB at the very beginning and it should have been like these three lines, but are combined with like a very thick report or something that justified this statement. I, I have seen just these three lines without any justification and I was like, why is the structure engineer sending this that very late? So. Well, this might have been related to them submitting something to DOB to show that they can add those two floors to the existing building and it just got put into our folder as just part of the, ma the big filing. Because this was a vesting application, right? Yes. So this isn't really related to vesting. Um, so it might have been a letter provided to DOB for B DOB's benefit. 
isn't it late in the process? I, I believe that they submitted something like that to the DOB before they obtained the permit, which was probably yes. 2015. So why, um, why is this being I sent? in 2016 and almost like like November 2016 that was like very late in the process so I don't know I don't know the answer to your question it, it could be it could be nothing it mm -hmm. could be a big deal I just wanted to like make sure okay. that we but paid attention to this and we put it in the record so okay but as Tony said DOB was sent out to inspect so if they saw flaws if they saw danger in the structure presumably they would have seen it but in addition to which, the entire structure is illegal. So if it doesn't vest, it comes down. Okay. Right? So should it be the dismissal? Um, no, I think we should vote based on the materials that yes, we have. Because maybe. I don't think they were going to persuade us that they'd vested with this illegal structure. Okay. So, yes, and did. they never bothered to submit anything further to persuade us. Right, so. and DOB never came back and said, okay, now all errors no. are cured and it's a valid permit. So right. you should vote that it's, you know, well, mm -hmm. doesn't meet the findings for it does not have valid permits. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Right. Okay. I'm sorry, I was just... Uh, Looking at the violations, all right. <clears throat> Item number 12, 2016-4296A and 4298A, 3236, 3238H Schley Avenue, and 580 Clarence Avenue, the Bronx. Um, at the prior hearing, we had had questions about the sidewalk continuity, the imposition of one of the houses on the required front yard, and compliance with the side yard regulations 23-461A. They submitted drawings and a cover letter that said they responded to the first two of those things, but I actually didn't see how it responded. The sidewalk still has this odd break in it, in two sides, and, and there's still a house sitting within the front yard, and there wasn't any mention about 23461A, as far as I could tell. But I, I repeat again that the drawings are so, have so many extraneous lines on mm -hmm. them. I don't know what, and that's what I said at the last two hearings, um, that I don't know what those lines are there for from our perspective. Uh, and it makes it extremely difficult to figure out what's going on. So um, if, in fact, the sidewalks are lining up, but you can't tell because of the extraneous lines, then take out those lines. Um, and if, in fact, the house doesn't penetrate the front yard, then um, show us how it's not penetrating the front yard. Or just show, give us a blow-up of, of that intersection. Without but it's not just this one. It's the one. There's, there's oh, okay. So it's this, sorry, sorry. It's, it's, it's this, one this one here that penetrates just, the front yeah. yard. Yeah. It's just this one. Yeah. So, and, so, and it's kind of like just take off that corner, chamfer the corner, and it doesn't penetrate the front yard. It's not that hard to do. We don't yet have the EP sign off on that? No, they um, they were originally going to amend the drainage plan. Now they're not. They're doing the sewer quarter. But th when they submitted their recent submission, DEP contacted me and said they had an issue with the plan. And I contacted the applicant. And so they're back and forth. OK. And then um, we haven't had DOT review the sidewall continuity issue. I mean, they, I, they need to make it continuous, but we haven't had a DOT review of this issue. So they should be looking at the drawings. Anybody sidewall else? continuity? OK. Yeah. Also, I think we, um, Commissioner, raised the comment about the dimensions and the square footage? Yeah, I was just comparing the plans that were submitted on, April, on November 2017 and to the latest submission. And um, I sent an email to the The dimensions oh. um, that are lot, lot size dimension, the lot area dimensions that are listed, shows that there is a change in the dimensions for lots 110 and 111. Though when you look at the lot dimensions, they're the same. So somewhere the lot size is reducing because the lot area is reducing. And when I'm looking at the boundary lot line, 
mm-hmm. dementias they're exactly the same so it's not and it could be that in the front some reduction happened but there isn't any dimension given right. that is helping me gauge that and i think if that dimension in the front since it's a pie if that dimension in the front of the pie becomes less it cannot become it cannot be the same it would almost have to be the same unless there's some jiggle or jag yeah. on on the line which it's not showing so it's just a simple drawing error probably that can be clarified mm-hmm. anybody else Item number 13 2016 40 330 and 4331A item number 14 2017 30A and item number 15 2017 226A this is 16 18 and 19 Tuttle Street Staten Island there is an adjournment request correct item number 16 2017 232A 1632 Richmond Terrace Staten Island So they revised the circulation plans to respond to our concerns about traffic being directed to Tompkins Court. Now they are the traffic wraps around and goes back to Richmond. Um, we instructed at the last hearing that the gate to Co- Tompkins Court be kept locked. Um, they need to show that on the plans. Uh, we need fire department to comment on this, make sure there's adequate turning radius. Um, and i didn't see on the plans the conditions that the fire department had required of them we need one set of plans that's going to be the ones that we stamp that has all of the conditions on right. them which included the entire building must be fully sprinklered um the frontage space standing space located on the main front entrance shall have roadway markings stating no standing any time fire zone i did see that note on one drawing but not on the other drawings and so that's the thing we can't have multiple drawings with different information it says uh, all Siamese connection locations shall be maintained free from all obstructions and have a serviceable hydrant within 100 feet and approved sign must be posted in the vicinity of the main front entrance which indicates the direction and distance to all Siamese locations and the internal fire la- lane that's indicated on the plan shall have no standing any time and information about those signs. So those notes have to appear on the drawing that is the BSA set. I know it's on the FD FD plan. I know, but it's on that plan and then sorry. So I don't know which set is the set we're supposed to use. There's also an architectural set and there's also I think a DEP set or something like that. Um there was one other set, DOT set, so we need one with everything. I just wanted for my own clarification um they are proposing to increase the width of that driveway by another 3 feet to um and i'm assuming that is that is being achieved by reducing the width of the building um i just want to want the applicant to kind of confirm that tomorrow mm. the plan drawing shows the dimension differences It's changed but i just want them to confirm it and Okay. So the the 3 feet of the building along that fire egress is going to be torn down and mm. re, re, the wall is going to be moved back 3 feet. Right. I just want to confirm. That. Okay. Mhm. Okay. Any other comments on this? Item number 17 2017 234A 266 Wild Avenue Staten Island. Hey, they showed they revised the plans to show tre- street trees. Um and there is a DEP site connection approval for stormwater water and sanitary discharge but i didn't find anything for water connection um or a final DEP sign off letter in response to the DEP's comment letter of March 5th 18 um normally we get a sign off letter as opposed to them showing us that they have stormwater connection permit right i also didn't find final um fire department's final sign off in response to fire department's um May 14th comment letter. Okay. Hopefully fire department will have something to. Yeah. New Megawan? Mhm. 
New cases, item number 18, 2016, 4473A, 7274 East 3rd Street, Manhattan. This is an MDL waiver. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application to DOB, but I don't find notice of hearing to DOB, um, which is supposed to happen, so please show us that. Um, this case has opposition represented by counsel. We also have a letter of opposition from a neighbor on the second floor and a common letter of opposition from seven neighbors dated February 28, 17. Um, just wondering whether in the, in the interim, and we've had other submissions since, whether any kind of relationships have improved. Um, fire department signed off on condition on April 24, 2018. Um, which I could read, but we don't need to. Uh, the building is a condo, and um, they provided what turned out to be quite a confusing letter of authorization from the condo board manager or president, I guess, um, which probably shouldn't have been sent or was prematurely sent. Um, with, the, with respect to the proposed safety measures, um, the number four symbol for non-combustible replacement of existing material and stair treads and landings points to the door saddles. Um, does that mean that the entire landing at each level will be replaced? I think so, but it's not 100% clear. And with what material? Because photos show the landings are some kind of ceramic tile at the entry hall and basement um, slash first floor. So those Will those floors be replaced? Because that's what the note says. Um, so I think the drawings are a little messy and need to be corrected. Um, they need to provide a detail for all the proposed interventions that are labeled notes one, two, and four. Um, they need to provide a section detail through the penthouse and the roof to show the fire separation there. Um, the existing penthouse at the roof appears to be open to the exterior. Is that an error or is that actually what's on? In fact, is it more like an open shed? It kind of reads like that, um, but I didn't really understand that. They need to show the heights of the parapets above the roof, heights above the roof, and show that it is continuous across the roof in plan P009, unless somehow the proposal is to remove it. So there's a high parapet that you have to step over in order to go from one side of the roof to the other. Um, the proposed penthouse appears to have a second door without a swing shown leading to the fire stair and a third door without a swing leading to the roof. Um, I don't know how you have a door that doesn't have a swing. They need to indicate that. Um, and I'm not sure that you're allowed to have three doors on a fire stair. So um, that's something fire department should probably comment on. Um, and with respect to that stairs, the <coughs> photos show it's in rather poor condition. So is there a proposal also to upgrade the enclosure of that fire stair? It, the masonry looks like it's in bad shape. Um, I, I think actually the construction cost estimate at $45,000 per apartment unit to bring the building to MDL compliance. Um, is probably an exaggeration since there is no plumbing associated with removing a section of a kitchen counter um, where there are no appliances shown. So they're talking about having to do replumbing and electrical and all this stuff where the, unless the drawings don't, aren't representative of the actual layouts of the kitchens, you're just cutting off a part of the counter um, in order to create a foyer at that stair corridor. Um, Basically, the cost is new walls and doors, some demo, but not much, and sealing up existing doors. Um, but nonetheless, in spite of all that, the BSA has granted waivers of this type before, where the scope of the fire safety improvements look like what is proposed here, more or less. Um, opposition complains about the proposed plans not taking into account certain clear access paths and access doors to the bulkhead. Um, the plans provided indicate that the door in question is related to a roof deck and not the existing penthouse. So I, I'm not really understanding what that <coughs> access issue is that opposition is complaining about other than a private contract, which is not our domain. Um, with respect to the condo board's authorization to do this project, 
or the project's potential contradiction of a condo board agreement. That's a civil matter that cannot be resolved by the BSA. Um, and so, uh, and we've had this kind of thing before where there's, um, a, there's a civil suit brewing and um, the BSA cannot be used to resolve a civil matter. So um, the owners need to work this out um, and decide whether or not um, they're going to allow this roof access, and then the BSA will will do its work. But there's no purpose in the BSA uh, granting an approval or working back and forth about <coughs> details and all of that if it turns out that the condo board is not going to approve it or this is going to go into litigation or something like that. And we've, we've had issues like this with easements and so on, where we wait for the easement issue to get resolved. Uh, and then we proceed, so. Any, any other comments on that? Um, I, I don't know to what extent these technical questions should be raised, but since we are questioning right. the basic merits of it. Um, so. But we're not questioning the merits. I mean, we'll no, no, no. Well, I'm, quite, I'm saying we have a letter of authorization from the representative for the condo board simply allowing them to file the application but it is but what they're trying to do is use the BSA by saying in fact that's what the applicant's letter says we need we can't move forward unless we have the BSA grant that's that's a true statement but you also can't move forward unless you the condo board will allow you to occupy this project if the condo board doesn't allow it, there's no purpose in us continuing. Us yeah, I would definitely like to understand what, I mean, to what extent we need to understand the board, uh, their condo board's operation. Like, don't they, shouldn't they have reviewed these plans beforehand just to kind of get a rough idea of what this This is really was? up to them. They could be the condo boards that never look at anything. They could be the condo boards that hire six architects that look at everything and all contradict each other. That's their business. That's how they do it, right? Um, but the fact that we have council representing opposition, we have sort of petition from several of the property owners who, in the end, get to decide what happens in their building, unless that's not what the condo agreement looks like, because maybe it's a condo agreement that says every man for himself. I mean, each one, each one's different, right? Especially in these little buildings. My um, only technical question, it was more for a uh, fire department, mm -hmm. is the roof has a six foot clear access path which goes from front to the back. And um, the, there's one existing penthouse extension which is located far away from that clear path. However, this proposal will be right in the middle of that. And I wanted to know, is that something FDNY had approved and or is that all consistent with all the other Right. Fire safety measures that has been applied here. Right. Fire department actually signed off on this initially, but I don't I know don't what know their what, what they looked at in terms of the obstruction of that path. Right. So, um, I just had some general questions. Um, in other cases like this, we've usually asked for the proposed plans that have their proposed measures to be color color coded, so we oh. can actually see it on each floor where they're actually putting the extra protection and then it usually corresponds oh. to a note. So it's kind of like what they did with their complying set, mm -hmm. but for their proposed set. Okay. So that was one of my questions, if they could do that. And then the other question was the narrative was not fully stating the fire, uh, fire hour rating of the addition of the second layer of type X fire code gypsum board to the underside of every staircase and um, the addition of the two layers of the 5 8 gypsum board to the cellar ceiling. That was important. Um, and also, I had a question about the addition of the two-hour fire-rated wall construction to the first floor public wall. In other cases, we've actually seen them reinforce all of the common areas straight up to the roof because you actually are, are expanding. And that it is a different type of ownership because it's usually the person owns the building and maybe mm -hmm. we you know, we felt that they have more money that they could spend to actually ensure the safety of people, but it seems like they're actually just securing the first floor, and it doesn't appear that they're doing anything to kind of secure the fire rating of the core going all the way up. I thought they were doing the 
walls in e in the staircase i didn't see that and so that's oh. why i guess it would be helpful if we had a color-coded oh, plan yes. and we could follow okay. along because it seems like it's just the first floor public hall all public halls and cellar will be sprinklers is that what you're asking about no i'm not uh, saying second no, layer, sprinklers. it's about I'm the addition about of a five eighth inch yeah around. the gypsum board enclosing yes which we've seen in other right, cases like this, where it goes all the way up to the roof. Yes, it should. Yeah, no, it's existing um, yeah. first floor public halls, so, two hours, yeah. gypsum board added to cellar ceiling, and the penthouse addition will be fireproof construction. And then the other thing is they're saying there, um, it says existing smoke carbon dioxide detectors in all apartments to remain, but it doesn't say whether they're hardwired, and we usually require the yes. hardwired detectors. So mm -hmm. shouldn't they be swapped out if yes. they're not hardwired? But yeah, okay. Um, it's an interesting. So on the, are you on drawings? Yeah. Yeah. Because that those little keys. See one, two, three. Look at one, two, three, four over here. Um, all com common areas. No. The, yeah, yeah. All common areas to be outfitted with with sprinklers and cellar to be fully sprinkler and final sprinkler layout. Um, provide second layer of type X fire core chip board to underside of all stairs and replace existing materials, stair treads, and landings. Higher way to roll construction to existing basement. You're right. I read that as including it on the sides of the walls. That, that's the problem with that little code system. Yes. Okay. Oh, it says existing hardwire smoke carbon detector. Oh, it does? It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. On, in the drawing it says so, but not in it, the not narrative. Not in the narrative. It yeah. doesn't yeah. say. But it would help then if they could color code the proposal. So yes. this way okay. then you can really see it clearly. Mm -hmm. So to be clear, the in all of the um, in the stair slash corridor enclosures at every floor have to have mm -hmm. the two-hour rated, and and the way you ensure the two-hour rating is by adding five eighths to yeah. the mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely right. We always require that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's one reason why I wanted a detail taken through each of the treatments so that we could really know what was done, what's being done. Any other comments on this? Yeah, I, I didn't see the uh, 2005 DUB approved plans. Do, do, we, do we have, did you see these in the folder, Tony? 2005? No. Yeah. I, I they said they, uh, they built that penthouse here <laughs> and approved permit in 2005. Do we? Uh, we no, don't we, don't, we don't have those, I don't think. Well, actually, there were some drawings that were submitted um, about that are earlier drawings that I think, I'm not sure what that, I'm just trying to remember. There were a set of earlier drawings that were provided so that we could understand, um, they were provided in connection with the dispute, right, but it seems like it's drawings from that time period. They were provided in connection with the, um, with the agreement that was made between the owners of the deck area mm -hmm. and um, the condo board so there's a drawing there that shows the conditions at the time but I don't know whether those were real DOB drawings I, I believe it would be beneficial if we get a copy of the 2005 DOB mm -hmm. approved plans Zoning calendar decision items, item number 19, 2016-4301-BZ. You're going to read the address? <laughs> I'm sorry, 136 Oxford Street, Brooklyn. That's what I said oh, it. She's multitasked. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry. Here. Plans were revised to include the conditions of the CCD1, and then they recently received a ZRD one for flood zone compliance, which we'll use as a model because they were able to get a good response. Um, I, one of the conditions of the um, ZRD one was that they provide two forms of mitigation 
um, because they're lifting the building higher than nine feet. And they said that, um, the, the commissioner said that, an, where was it, a balcony, projecting balconies didn't count as mitigation. So I wasn't really sure whether the correction that was made actually complies because it's not really a balcony. It's actually a covered porch. There's sort of this extended sort of roof thing over this thing that might be considered a porch now because there's a staircase that goes down. So I would just say that um, that um, we could condition that the, um, on the ZRD1 for mitigation elements being complied with and also that the, um, that the project has to comply fully with Article 6, Chapter 4. But the other thing that's missing from the drawings, which needs to be added right away, is the note that I requested several requests ago um, be added to the plans, which says removal of existing walls and joists in excess of that shown on the approved BSA plans will avoid the special permit. So that's not on the drawings. Okay. Move on? Yeah. Continued hearing items, item number 20, 14 BZ, 147 row Row Queens. And I'll have the applicant's name changed. It's actually Jay Goldstein. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't remember. So, realize. and with respect to that, we don't have, um, since representation changed, we need a new owner's authorization form. We don't have that. Um, I didn't see any changes to the plans, actually, other than the addition of a refrigerated trash room, very small, um, which I thought was in a very odd place, given the location of the kitchen, far away from it, and egress to the street. So I'm imagining them dragging, you know, kind of dripping garbage bags down the stairs and through an operating class or something like that. Um, my, my biggest problem with this project is that the building is very large and it is attached to this little house. They're treating it as part of the semi-attached, detached. Right? Um, I, and most of the time when we see these kinds of projects, there's a something. small side yard that separates the buildings from each other. So my, my first main reaction, which is consistent with how I reacted the last time, is that the building needs to be separated with like a five foot side yard. Um, the last time that we talked about this, there was a lot of focus on the subject of the rabbinical court, and now the subject of the rabbinical court seems to have been disappeared or suppressed or I don't know what. Minimized. Minimized. Yeah. There's another one, downplayed. Um, well, I think their have? argument is that the, the, the primary uses during the Sabbath uh, and, and the, all of the spaces in the building is going to be utilized and will be needed. So it's only on, on, on for all the religious purposes, all of these spaces will be used. So for those non-religious days, it will serve extra use. Service, mm -hmm. but that's not what's driving it. It's really the that's Sabbath what they that's say, driving. right? That's a okay. so that's what they say. But then I didn't see the daily. So they submitted August second, twenty seventeen, and September eighteenth, twenty fourteen. I didn't realize it's been going on for so long. A daily schedule um, and a programmatic needs analysis. Neither of those were updated. So you don't see, actually, there's sort of this general narrative that talks about how those rooms will be used, but you don't see the kind of hourly, daily usage that we really should see to prove that it's got a purpose other than what was stated earlier, which is really servicing not the congregation specifically, but a very large community, right? Um, Right, like the narrative just says now that, well, you know, it's part of the rabbi's job to counsel people in the congregation, and so they want to have the room for him to do that and to have the flexibility to counsel in large groups and small groups and, and the ability to provide privacy for people waiting and people in sessions so that they don't see each other. Right. So. Right. So, you know, it's true that <laughs> rabbis need an office and so on, but, you know, before it, we can't unlearn what we know, right. right, or what we learned already. And unless the program truly has changed, you need to explain to us better 
um, how the, that extra floor, which is making the building tall, um, is actually needed um, in connection with the act, sort of day-to-day -day operations of a synagogue that's got a children's teaching program. And all that. Right, but they do, I mean, to me, they do talk about the children's program in greater depth in terms of breaking apart all the ages yes. and putting them in different rooms, which kind of fills the rooms, mm -hmm. so to speak. And if we didn't know what we know now, right. let's say, or what we knew before, rabbinical court kind mm -hmm. of thing, we have approved a rabbi's study and a rabbi's yes. small library and, and conference room. So it's not unusual to see that kind of thing on the top floor. Right. So I, I personally am happy to see the rabbinical court discussion stricken from the newest submission. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at it again as if I would look at it as if it were just coming to us. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I could see where that would be reasonable, mm -hmm. that a rabbi would have his own office, a library, and a room where he could counsel his own flock. Mm -hmm. So I didn't find it unreasonable, to be okay. honest with you. Yeah, okay. I, I was reviewing in a similar way. I was comparing it to some of the other uh, cases that we see and similar kind of nature of programs. And the way the programmatic argument has been made seems to line up the, uh, the, the kind of the breakdown of the ages and all of that seem to be similar in pattern of what we have seen. So yes, there would be, and the way I, I think it's okay, if you're going to, if it's going to serve the main purpose, which is your holy uh, the Sabbath period, and that's the primary function, and you want to make sure your building is designed to accommodate the need for that day. And if there are extra days that can be used for something else, repurposing, I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's and uh, but the primary use is the Sabbath use, mm -hmm. and I, I was okay with that. That's how I read it, mm -hmm. and I was comparing it with some of the other cases that how we look at the programmatic breakdown. So mm -hmm. okay, so I, I felt okay. And and relative, I just wanted to throw in that they need to provide the side elevations and the proposed materials, which we asked for at the last hearing, but. Um, what about this, the, the scale of the building and its relationship to the little guy next door? I, this is a row of attached homes on, both on, in that whole neighborhood. This, the way this building should be looked at is, like it's kind of, oftentimes you see attached buildings where the ends are a little bit bigger, they're like bookends. Mm -hmm. And I see this as a bookend of that. And right across the street, there is a very large, uh, I think it's a synagogue or a yeshiva, I'm not sure. But it's a it's a 200 by 200 huge site. This is much smaller in comparison, and it's going to be a bookend of it. And there really is not much of a sidewalk along that street, um, which is kind of all the buildings have the side to it. They really don't face it. They don't use it. So I, was a, I never had an issue with that side yard at the beginning. My concern was trying to maximize the front and the back, and they have tried to do that as much as they could by extending the cellar space as much to the front in the, uh, in the lower floors. I was okay with it, especially the way typically you see these book and homes tend to be a little bit bigger on the sides, so I kind of took it as that from a neighborhood character point of view. I mean, I think in this area we've seen other cases of synagogues that were on the corner like that at the end of the row house that were larger. I think probably the applicant could could make its case by pointing those out because mm -hmm. I, I don't believe this is the only one. I believe there have been a couple of others that we have approved that back were in the day like this? that were yeah, because this whole neighborhood is almost the same exact housing stock, yeah. two story attached row houses, one after another block after block after block. But on the corners sometimes you see a synagogue. Yeah. And it's larger. And it has like almost total lock coverage, you know. So it, it'd be helpful if they would point that out, then that could be more mm -hmm. convincing of their character case. Mm -hmm. yeah. And given that it's in the corner in terms of the light and the shadow and other, it's there's some <coughs> of the street widths and others that it doesn't create that much of an, um, I would say, light and air issue to the buildings to the front or to the rear. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I was okay. With any other comments? All right. 
Item number 21, 30214 BZ, 4504 Francis Lewis Boulevard, Queens. Um, the last hearing was marked adjourned, but in fact, the architect and the owner's rep appeared and provided us with revised drawings um, that day that responded to some of our earlier comments. Um, the entrances from the sidewalk, which is what was on those drawings, and parking area are now entirely from Francis Lewis frontage, which is what we requested they do. There are 13 parking spaces. The floors between the buildings appear to line up and the facade is much more residential in character. The landscaping plan is pending our review because they hired a landscape architect. Um, at the last hearing, we asked for a maneuverability plan, um, but now they're doing valet parking. So I'm curious whether people think um, a valet a parking maneuverability plan is necessary or whether the the street system will need to be used in order to make that valet parking work. Um, that's a general question. Um, they need to show the proposed materials on the elevations. Um, we still need the calculation to show compliance with open space versus area covered by parking and driveways. They didn't give us that calculation. Um, the zoning calculation sheet now shows the project complying with all the zoning regulations. So if that's true, then, you know, go forth. But you don't need the BSA. So that obviously is a mistake, and you need to sh correct that to show what the waivers are being sought. And then um, I'm just wondering, should we, I forget actually what we decided about this with the bus stop. This, the bus stop is right next to the parking, to the, what might become an active driveway. I think the applicant stated that the DOB, they had reached out to DOB and DOB, DOT, oh, or sorry, DOT, DOT. And, and, I, and they did not have an issue or something. I, I don't, I don't have it. Okay, so that's the thing. I couldn't find <coughs> notes on it, and so I'd like the applicant to just reiterate what the yeah. what the approach is, what with the um, with the driveway conflict with the bus stop. Because, I mean, it's sort of, I don't know that it's something that you can condition an approval on, but it should be something like that, they, that the applicant should reach out to DOT or, or it's really the TA about relocating the bus stop. So at the October 30th review session, my notes say uh, you suggested that the BSA take no position as to whether the curb cut location would be acceptable to DOT? Ah, right, we wouldn't take it. Right, it, and it's not a position, it's taking no position relative to DOT, but whether or not the applicant could reach out to the TA and see whether the bus stop could be relocated. Okay. I mean, I don't think it's the only time that there's a driveway related to a bus stop, but um, this might be quite an active driveway with patients coming and going. Mm -hmm. Maybe also with doctors, although the doctors might go through that other, through the front. Or yeah. Okay. Anybody else on this one? I had a question on this one. Um, typically, in these cases, does DOB review the location of the curb cut um, in terms of DOB, uh, in terms of bus uh, or the other street access points? I don't know. I don't know. So curb cut, there's just rules about where you can put a curb cut. It can't be within X distance of a tree, a fire hydrant, or this and this, but I don't know the what they do stop. about the entire length of the mm -hmm. bus stop. So, yeah, we, so the applicant should obviously speak to that. Item number 22, 2016, 4468BZ, 27 East 61st Street, Manhattan. Um, our last hearing focused on the reliability of the financials and comparables and whether they support the requested scope of waivers. So basically this mission was about financials, so I'm going to defer basically everything to Commissioner Otley Brown. My only comment is that the revised financial report holds firm that the retail market has declined 
and posits $286 a square feet, foot as the reasonable rent for the retail, even though um, the asking at a directly comparable site on East 62nd Street is $533, and Madison Avenue rents, according to um, a report from November 17th, were averaging $1,368. And so I'm just intuitively saying, okay, okay, it's not on Madison, so it's, let's just say it's 50% of being on Madison. So that's way higher than $286 a square foot, so I'm not convinced. So the way I see it, there were two major issues that were still being debated. Number one, the state of the market, was it still falling or was it stabilizing? And number two, the percentage of a discount of comparables that are located off Madison Avenue versus the ones that are actually located on Madison Avenue. And so it was the argument by the applicant that the market is still in a state of, of decreasing or free fall, so to speak. And so therefore, their um, rents that they actually predicted of $300 a square foot were actually appropriate set given the background so I just want to say that now actually the rents have been reduced to 286 the square foot ground floor instead of 300 and we haven't even agreed that their read of the market is accurate and so I just want to say that I have myself read their papers but I've also read the Rebney second quarter 2018 real report, a retail report, the Cushman Wakefield first quarter 2018 retail report, and also an article about the state of the um, high street retail, uh, retail. And all three of those reports basically say that the retail market is starting to stabilize overall as the retail industry is adjusting to the changing trends in how customers shop. And because of that, that's actually filtering down to the street and the asking rents are stabilizing. And in fact, there's actually more leasing activity. So that's beginning to change the market in that it's going to start to eat up all of the availability and that's actually going to lead to a greater increase in retail rents. And so given that information, along with statistics that like the Redney report shows for second quarter retail in 2018 that is actually in Madison Avenue not continuing the record of decreases but actually reversing them a little leads me to think that the applicants assumed rents for the proposed are not accurate. I feel that they're actually under assuming what you could possibly get there. As to the second question, the percentage of discount for being located off of Madison Avenue, I didn't find anything that they submitted to be a factual statement of the percentage that you should actually decrease for being 50 or 60 feet located off of Madison Avenue. The comparables that they gave us, two of them are east of Park Avenue, Park Avenue and east of there to Lexington, and those are two different markets, so I don't think that you can show me those comparables and say that's going to be indicative of what's going on 60 feet off of Madison Avenue. They do make the argument that with all of the availability, why bother going off of Mad 50 feet off of Madison Avenue when you can get a great deal on Madison Avenue. That's, that may be true, but it doesn't necessarily justify such an incredible decrease in asking rents. So. Basically, I'm not convinced at all. I certainly don't think that there is a reason to show a decrease between last month's report and this month's report. And I think that a lot of the times when applicants point to um, reports about asking rents going down and then incorporating that information to justify their own decrease of rents that are low to begin with, it's not appropriate. So it's not a question where the asking rents in the first report were around $1,300 a square foot, and so now the market is indicating that maybe it's $1,000 a square foot, so they should lower it. Asking rents were around $1,300 a square foot, and they're at $300 a square foot. You can't use that 
that statement of the market decreasing to justify lowering an already too low asking rent of $300 now to 286 mm -hmm. So I think that this has been the problem from the get-go, where I've always felt that they've underestimated the amount of rent they could get for this space. And um, they've never really addressed that. They've just justified that, well, the market at 1300 is lower than it was when it was at 2000 and it may actually go lower to 1000 Well, you're not even close at $286 a square foot. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't find their arguments very convincing. And so because of that, the <coughs> finding is really still in play. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious whether... Um, if you were to make some assumptions based on the data that you have, whether those might support a lesser variance. For example, they're asking for extensions into the rear yard at the fifth and the sixth floor, um, which is much less valuable retail space anyway, right, because you're so high up. Um, and so I'm, and, um, and even the fourth floor extension, which could also arguably be in play like that, whether um, by <coughs> doing the math there, you might get to a place where what they're really looking for is to be allowed to have retail all the way up, um, and, and that that be this, the extent of the waiver instead of also those rear yard impositions. Oh, I, I definitely feel that if I were to do the math myself, I would certainly find that they can have enough of a waiver being allowed to continue the retail and what was already built without further building out that additional space that they began. And, you know, perhaps being that we've asked for this information several times and we've not been satisfied with what we've received, perhaps that is what I need to do. So I will... Okay. Go back, relook at it, and um, plug in what I feel are values that are a little more convincing okay. for the rents. But wh why would we do the math for somebody that we asked him to submit something and he just ignored our request? Because then we can give them, we can tell them that the only, if, if you're here for a waiver, we've determined that the only waiver that we might entertain <coughs> is this one. But right now, they're, either we vote based on these requested waivers and that's that which seems not to be in the actual service of the project or we vote on a lesser variance and the lesser variance would be i mean because i'm i'm persuaded that the ground floor having two functions is impractical for this tiny site right so to have to have a lobby and everything that goes up to residential really ruins the retail component on the ground floor so it does make sense that the entire building would be retail from that kind of practical okay. perspective of the site. Um, but it doesn't uh, automatically mean that you get all that additional retail floor area at the rear where they're trying to build back several, build several floors all the way to the rear lot line. Um, that doesn't necessarily need to be included in this. Right, so you could reduce the scope of the waiver, and maybe that would playing out whatever is a reasonable expectation of a retail rent on that, and that way we can say we are directing you to do this. If you don't want to do this, then mm -hmm. we can either vote or you can withdraw or however, however, right? Right. Okay. Otherwise, we we get stuck. Otherwise, it's hearing after hearing, or we just vote and decide that they haven't made the B finding, which I don't think is in the interest of the project. Yeah, I, I, I got the same thing with the financials, with the cost estimate. Last hearing, I, I asked them to submit too many things, mm -hmm. and they said they will. I, I did ask the, their counsel, can you give me an answer to this? And he said, no, I cannot. However, we will submit. Uh, I, I have puzzles in the construction cost estimate regarding the shoring, the excavation, the concrete film, and they submitted nothing. I couldn't believe they did. Actually, I went to the hearing, and I did listen to the executive session and the hearing itself, and I did mention this through both, but again, the, the post is made or submitted nothing to us. Okay, so, 
So I, I, when I say nothing, I mean nothing. nothing regarding what we asked for details. And how did you get to the uh, the shoring quantity? How did you get to the excavation, the concrete, the, all these kind of elements? Right. Just numbers. So I, I do have a question about that because we had said at the last hearing that we were going to use the baseline of the existing the building that's approved by DOB as their baseline, right? And then whatever changes need to be made to the thing that was approved by DOB and constructed, right? Um, so when we talk about that as a baseline, isn't that essentially like you're buying a piece of property already improved for the acquisition? Or, it, or are you looking at it as a vacant lot plus the construction cost to bring it up to that spot, to that baseline? and then you move forward. I, I'm just trying to understand understand how deeply we need to get into the cost of the foundations because we're assuming that the building is there, which it is, right? So, right, so, like if the, if the, when we look at the purchase of a new building, I mean of an existing building that, that's going for a waiver, we don't look at the construction costs to build the building that's been sitting there for 10 years or 30 years, right? We don't look at that. So that that's my question here when we say baseline what what is the baseline I mean for this that's a question for Commissioner Holly Brown so oh for yeah me. yeah for you <laughs> so what when we're talking baseline and we say they built this building pursuant to DOB permits right mm -hmm. they don't want to pursue that project but the building exists so if that's the the baseline what are we looking at as the acquisition cost is it land it's land plus the building in its existing form but so how do we look at the building in existing form do we really so for example again if we were looking at a built at a site where you've got an existing building that's been there for 40 years sometimes we look for vacant land and then we add um, we add the replacement cost new less depreciation or building sales okay sometimes you look at the lot and the building as one in a building sale of a like building right you're so, right though you're absolutely right then we don't overturn the foundation costs and examine it because it's you know it's kind of justified in the sales price or in the um assumption that the remaining building life is accurately assessed right you're right you are right about that. So then, rather than, so, so there should be some baseline number that we're using, which is vacant lot plus assumed development costs as opposed to known development costs, right? Like it costs $400 a square foot or wherever it is to build in New York, and therefore that's your replacement value. And we don't look at how much the foundations actually cost because you're trying to come up with the acquisition price for the bill for the for the land plus the building let me just look at let me just go back to land plus cost to get the building to the current condition because i know that's not how we started we instructed them right at the last hearing that this was the baseline the right because they were using the, the pre-existing building as the baseline and since we asked them to change the baseline to the build condition correct correct yeah, I believe the way they are doing it, they are considering vacant land plus development costs to come to the current condition. Right, but so we don't want to be looking the way we might if it's new construction for a variance, yeah. right? We want the building to be there already. So we don't want to be looking at the foundations in detail. It's not relevant to us. They're already there. Unless right? they've been modified to bring the building to the current condition. So that, so that delta is open for examination. So the question is, has there been any change in the foundation to support the additional space? Because that's what we had. we said the site value should be the land plus the cost to bring the building to the current right condition. So, but one would argue costs are like real true estimates based on. Well, know, that's what they gave they, us. They, they give us a listing of the costs of what it would take to do 
to bring it to the current condition. So, I mean, I suppose that could be examined. Mm -hmm. Whether or not the existing foundations need to be re-examined, if they don't change, that's, that's yeah. definitely a point. I mean, but the, if there's any change to support the extra weight of those extra, the extra floor and stuff, then that's open for examination. But so, okay, the base building, um, sorry, I need to look at the drawings again. The base building doesn't have the rear yard extensions, right? So the, the base building is, um, that was approved by DOB, actually does have the rear yard extensions. But it doesn't have the extra floors. Yeah, it does. Because it it's so already it, built out. Yeah. They got so, approved. So the, exists, the, the approved building has to the lot line from basement to first fifth floor, floor, second floor, third floor, and fourth floor. Uh, and then it's set back mm -hmm. as, as permitted yes. uh, for the remaining two, uh, remaining three, to the roof. Two and, stories and, plus two the stories penthouse. And, and the penthouse. And that's what it's built to currently, and that's what it's been approved for. Yes. So they already there is the so and I s since there is already the rear yard extension for the floor four floors above the basement I'm assuming the foundation is right it's going to then in that case <coughs> then you wouldn't reopen that you wouldn't reopen Re you wouldn't re-examine the whole foundation right that's what I'm saying so since we come to this building already built like this. Right? That's an existing building on the site. So the acquisition cost should be land plus the cost of improvements in some standard way, however that's standardly done. Not known way, not the way where they're sitting there and counting how many doors and how many windows and how many this and that, right? There should be just, what do we normally do when we're looking at land plus improvements as a way of a value of Are, are you talking appraising? about like a flat three per square foot to bring land to a building? Yeah, but I'm talking about what what no, appraisal value. Sometimes we do, do get the uh, we get the construction costs that are actually delineated for that, and then a depreciation oh. is applied to it. But we don't we don't sit there and kind of reinvent the wheel, so to speak, on the site value portion. The reinventing the wheel is usually to anything that's added. Okay. Right. The only reinventing of a wheel might be a debate over was depreciation properly determined, mm -hmm. was the effective building age valid and properly determined, right. that kind of thing. So but what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at is I don't want to look at the foundations and how much they actually cost and all of that stuff if what well, our goal is simply to determine what the acquisition value of the site is. Right. right, but if they're overvaluing the develop the construction costs in order to raise the acquisition price, then that then that that's the that's the other part of the question. I thought we used sort of like a standard to say, you know, we couldn't find any um, any buildings that are like this building. So instead, we find vacant land because we know the price of vacant land. We know the estimated price on new construction um, replacement costs. Therefore, the acquisition value for this site with a build improved should be X. And then we just use that. That's, that's possible. Yeah. So uh, that's something maybe we don't have an answer to right now, but I, th I think that needs to be clarified because this baseline approach hasn't been properly pursued, I don't think, by the applicant. Instead, they were still in the, we're building this thing from scratch, and we're using the existing original building that was a 19th century building. We're adding to that, and then, and so they're treating it as if that's part of the construction costs to prove to us that the variance is needed, right? And it's not, because they went ahead, they built the building approved by DOB. And now they need a waiver because they discover upon building that it's not really working out for the use that's allowed. I, I agree with you. I believe the approach you're suggesting is, is more accurate than what they are adapting right now. 
Mm-hmm. And I believe the reason they adapted this because it's more <coughs> favorable for them to go that route. Well, it's definitely a confusing project, so it took us a while to get there too, right? It, it took us a while to realize that we were starting from the wrong place, mm-hmm. right? So I'm not faulting them from having approached it this way. It took us a while to realize that I don't. that's probably not the right approach. Okay. Green. So should we ask them to change the financials? No, no, so that's what I want um, Commissioner Otley Brown to take a look at, like what's the right way of viewing the baseline so that we can look at what the delta is between baseline and the actual work that needs to be done to bring the building into um, proposed condition. Proposed versus as of right versus lesser variance, et cetera, right? Right. So we I thought would, we did this already. Yeah, though. we already vetted this. Yeah, I thought we, we did directed too. them, but I don't think we directed them. But I don't think they got there. But they, according to me, my notes, it seems like they got there with the baseline because that was just the last year. No, I, there was a long gap in between the. I mean, and I it was just again, in but April. We discussed the baseline. Right, I have construction costs, new figures based on the cost to bring, bring the building from the current state to the as of right condition with DOB egress variance for the proposed condition. We had asked for um, building sales and they didn't have any. Mm-hmm. Site value is the land plus the cost to get the building to the current condition. Yes. Yeah. That's what we said they should do. That's but there were no submissions subsequent to in that. In February they did this. Oh. I, I have in my note of 416 was that they had factored in the current building into the site value. That's all I have in my note. Okay. Right. As, all right. So. And therefore. Um, April. The sorry. Building. April 1st they did yeah. this. I have it as being that done. That they actually that did Everything it. was simplified. And the site value thereby went down from 17 million to 7 uh, to 7.7 7 million. Right, and part of that was a correction to the uh, maximum allowable building area yeah. that we told them yeah. to make. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Okay. All right. Could you just take another look at that so we can make sure that we're using the right baseline because I, again, I don't want to be talking about the cost of the foundations and all of that sort of stuff in a baseline building. It should be some sort of very basic analysis that gets you to a baseline building. Um, okay. Okay. That's confusing. <laughs> Everybody else okay? Move on. Right. Yeah. Item number 23, 2016, 4472BZ, 245.01 to 245.13 Jamaica Avenue, Queens. They requested an adjournment. <laughs> Item number 24, 2017, 228 BC, 13166 40th Road, 13168 40th Road, and 40-46 College Point Boulevard, Queens. Okay. Did everyone see the Community Board 7 submission? No. Um, I did, yeah, so hold on one second. Oh, was there, wait a minute, a more recent submission just There was now? one, it's dated June 22nd, submitted. No. It says that, dear Madam Chair, we've received the Fox Rothschilds BSA response package for a variance to permit development of a nine-story community facility, John Charles Wang Community Health Center, and sites of sections. There are many significant changes to the original plan as demonstrated by the engagement of a new architect and dramatically changing the design of a building form from nine stories to six stories without reduction of bulk. Although many of the questions and objections raised by your board and ours appear to be ans- may appear to be answered, these answers are incomplete and raise many new questions. We will try and repeat to appear at your next hearing on Tuesday, June 26, mm-hmm. but regardless, we ask you to keep this hearing open and please ask the applicant to reconvene with our board to review these extensive changes before the board, your board makes a decision. Our land use committee remains extremely active during summer hours, and we would meet with this <laughs> applicant as soon as they are available. This is one one unusual community board. They they meet in August. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not August. But anyway, okay. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So um, 
we did get just to continue on that so yes they changed their architect which I found kind of surprising to do that midstream which had a, a significant impact on the design of the project and eliminated a lot of um, insistent solutions like that mechanical floor for some reason was able to be completely eliminated um, and then of course we talked a lot about the side yard setback and why they had it at all um, so they eliminated that but it's not as if the, the then architect couldn't have done that but there was a real assistance insistence on the need for that mechanical floor so um, so we do have more support for the A finding, though, both the narrow lot depth to justify the front setback waiver and the parking waiver, because it is a narrow lot, so it's hard to fit in the mm -hmm. ramps and all that stuff, as well as uh, educational deference, since the facility is part of the CUNY Medical School Clinical Program. Um, the plans were revised um, and just been reviewing them. There, the elevator doesn't go to the lev the cellar level of parking, and since it's not valet parking, I just don't see how you can't have how the elevator doesn't go there. Um, also, there's a very um, long ramp system going from the um, grade from the sidewalk to the entrance, <coughs> um, whereas the prior plan entered directly off grade, and I don't see that that is practical solution at all for a medical facility where you've got wheelchairs, strollers, who knows what, coming in on wheels very, very frequently. And so the idea of them all going up a ramp when you could enter at grade is confusing. I know there's a little bit of a slope. I think the parking lot to, is to be used only by staff. And so not you're, not allow, it's, it's, you're not allowed to have staff not able, you have disabled staff, they're going to be no, walking no, up no. a ramp. I'm, that I'm not, I and anyway, you're not allowed to limit this to staff. It's accessory mm -hmm. parking, right? It's accessory parking, that's the whole point. If you have a disabled person, they need to park in the building with access to an elevator. So, um, so where was there? Okay, so there's a so, but I'm also talking about the ramping system to get from grade, from the sidewalk into the building, which before was direct. Um, and then um, they did eliminate that five yard setback, so um, in the side yard, um, so you don't need that waiver anymore. Mo more program space was located on the building fronting the College Point Boulevard, which was good because that's why we were asking why aren't you using that site. Um, the building was reduced in height from eight floors in a penthouse or 97 feet high plus the penthouse to six floors and 85 feet high, 85 <coughs> Excuse me. A height and setback waiver is still needed since the maximum base height here is 60 feet and a parking waiver is still needed because 199 spaces are required and only 34 provided. Um, there was a transportation analysis provided back in April, April 10th by AKRF. So um, I don't really think that it would reflect actually this project even though the floor area didn't change um, because the date on AKRF's um, submission is earlier than the date of the drawings the revised drawings so they need to update to reflect the actual project um, the parking analysis that was previously submitted indicated a demand of 45 spaces but that's based on gross square footage so that didn't change um, and it assumed that the overflow would be handled in the shopping mall across the street. Um, although the mall provided a letter of welcome, you know, please do come here. Um, it's <coughs> not a commitment to keep 10 spaces available for this use. Um, we asked at the last hearing why they couldn't use stackers here to get the last 10 spaces of demand. Um, and now, and we learn by seeing so many different kinds of parking applications here that you can get automatic stackers so that a person can self-park using a stacker um, so they wouldn't necessarily have to have valet. Um, so those were my comments. Others? Um, I would like a little bit more clarity on the programming uh, of the spaces specifically why the nursing station and the teen workstation is being proposed on floors three to five. Um, the initial plan had one nurse station on the second floor and one workstation on the seventh floor. And so it seems there is an increase in this 
uh, nursing station and workstation, and that was not clear from the narrative. Um, and that goes to the the reason I'm asking that question is because that's also the area where the variance is being requested. So uh, I'd like to be clear on that. Uh, with regards to the reduction in the parking, I was thinking of the project that we had just approved, I think, at the last hearing, which is uh, four or five blocks to the north of this site that also had a, well, that was a mixed use. It had medical, hotel, and retail uses, and that also requested a parking waiver. Um, and I was wondering if it's um, there also, the, the area doesn't change that much in terms of the parking need and the north or south mm -hmm. of Roosevelt uh, Avenue, the, the parking supply is pretty daunting. There's no doubt. The so supply is daunting in the sense of not adequate on street. Is yeah, that what you mean? There is enough yeah. on street parking. So always parking is provided through additional parking spaces that are um, in the other buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, based on my side visit of the um, shopping mall, it is used, but it has thousands of parking spaces. So I would find it hard to believe that on a weekday it would be very difficult. Today, but I mean these are permit. So I think the main issue is these are permanent uses, and so as more and more buildings get built or uses change and so on, and the demands increase, and you know arguably, so you can't necessarily because they said at the shopping mall we have 40 to 50 spaces available at any given time. That's much less than what I expected to hear in a in a place with thousand spaces I would have expected them to say we have 500 spaces they sit there and kids rollerblade you know skateboard in them kind of thing so it's not actually a lot of open spaces and um, leads me to con be concerned that in future um, some other retailer will come in and might have heavier parking demands like what if they added another restaurant that has a higher parking demand or something and, but I didn't understand your comment about the other site. Um, that was a special permit, so we're only reducing the parking with respect to the right. medical, I'm just right? looking at the parking reduction uh, that was requested. And here, it's, though it's a variance, and... Uh, right, but the, in that parking reduction, they were satisfying their demand. Yeah, they were satisfying their demand. Here, they're demands. not satisfying their demand. They have a shortfall. So have a shortfall. I, I would just like to say that usually when we do analyze mm -hmm. these, if there is a shortfall, they have to have some kind of a legal tie to availability. Right. And they're not showing that here. We have this letter from the other operator that's like, if we have it, you can use it. But right. that's not a legal a tie that is reserving 10. Usually there is, and we have seen cases in right. different types of cases where an operator of a garage will say, we are reserving 10 spaces, you know, from now until 20 years from now. Right. For a monthly fee of blah, Fair blah, point. blah. I, I forgot about that. Yeah. So then my next question is, why can't they do a split valet slash self-park, which I've, I've actually seen in places where, you know, you could come in on a floor of the parking garage and there's a valet option for a portion of the parking garage and then there are on upper floors self-park options. So being that you have two floors here and the first floor can, it looks like it can accommodate stackers, why can't they add 10 spaces on the first floor and let that be a valet floor? I think the issue with valet is that it costs, you know, you have to hire, you have to hire somebody to be there and attend. Right, that's why I was suggesting automatic parking, where you drive in to a slot, you put your card in or whatever it is, and it, and the car disappears, and then the next person can go in. I mean, it's it's just very interesting because yes, valet parking is costly, but this is a huge building, and you can pass that cost off through that building. It's, it's not like you're talking about valeting a building that has 10,000 square feet and your valet is, you know, it's going to one tenant who's paying it. You're talking about, what, 60,000 square feet? You yeah. can't absorb the cost of a couple of employees right. on one floor of valet parking? Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. just find that hard to this believe. This is also a medical 
facility that is provided. Uh, not for profit. It's, it's a non-profit. It's yes. still, so we're talking 60,000 square feet that you have to, have to raise you have to distribute mm -hmm. two salaries across right. 60,000 square feet. Yeah. I don't know that it's as expensive as right. one would think. Yeah. But in addition to which, I don't, I, the neighborhood is so concerned about parking and um, you really can't count on those other spaces in the adjacent lasting forever. Um, unless it's tied with some Unless legal there's a legal, which we did talk to them about doing and they didn't get it. All they got is a, you are welcome to park your letter. So, yeah, so I'd say <laughs> those are their choices. Mm -hmm. Make a deal or provide for the provide demand for on the your space. own site. Yeah. And they may be able to more efficiently lay out the parking. I don't know. I saw, I saw maybe three spaces more you could put in. Um, maybe there's another way, but they need ten spaces. And you know, with that other site, it's also it's not nearly the level of reduction here. Normally, our special permits only a fifty percent reduction. That would mean ninety nine spaces or a hundred spaces, right? Here, they're going to a fraction of that. Mm -hmm. so. Move on. Mm -hmm. Item number 25, 2017, 235BZ, 1102, 11 02, Supton Boulevard, Queens. Okay, um, Community Board 12 submitted a revised um, recommendation on April 16th um, that clarifies that it was what they voted on was a denial with two abstentions. I understand how that happens. On a community board, you um, you propose a resolution and then the community approves the resolution to deny, right? But when it's not a well-written resolution, you don't actually know what happened at the community board. So that's why um, it, it read like that. And then also council member Adrian Adams, who apparently was the chair of the community board at the time, wrote two very angry letters yes. <laughs> um, uh, expressing <clears throat> almost amazement that the applicant could misrepresent in her eyes um, what actually um, happened at the community board um, and was clear that they had voted to deny. So um, after discussion last time about how hideous the enclosure of the tower um, was in those drawings. They came back with a slightly revised version of a tower decor, is all I can call it, um, which, uh, and then an explanation for why it can enclose it further because of all these different kinds of structural shear loads, um, uh, wind loads, and so on. Um, the proposal remains as hideous as it was before. It's just that more like rustication or something on rusticated stonework idea. Um, and I think it's very much out of place in the neighborhood, um, hardly an aesthetic asset. And when they did their um, kind of rendering, you sort of walk around, you see, now you see it, now you don't. Um, that underscores how out of place this is in the neighborhood and what really an eyesore it is. Um, so they also um, submitted s some information from um, a, a, a engineering firm to talk about the radio frequency levels and how there wouldn't be a danger and so on. And we are constrained in these um, reviews from considering the effect of the electromagnetic fields and so on on the community only to see whether um, hot spots are, are exceeding general public levels <coughs> that are established by, I guess, by the FCC. Um, so we, we can't deny an application on the basis of that. But on the other hand, um, we do have the authority to talk about neighborhood character and we don't usually, are, we're not usually confronted by that subject with these antennae. Usually they're put on a roof and it's a little, they're pretty short and we don't really see much in the way, or they're really kind of out of sight. Or in one case, we had a radio tower on top of some very tall apartment buildings. So you don't actually, it, it was in an area where already the neighborhood has, has tall structures, right? 
So what, what this is telling me is there's a property owner who either approached the telecommunications people or the other way around and um, said, you know, it'd be, it'd be great, I could make more money if I rented out the roof of my building to um, this radio transmitter, but um, our, our job isn't, necessar isn't to facilitate the income of that property owner. Instead, here, it's to see whether this is an appropriate location for this use, and my feeling about it is this, this is a very inappropriate location. If you wanted to put a radio transmitter in this neighborhood, then you find a vacant lot, a parking lot, or something, and you, and you strike a deal like that, and then the thing can look like a clock tower, or a tree, or not a tree, or just be a pole, or something, but what this is being constrained because you're building on top of a one-story building that doesn't isn't structured to sustain the wind forces and so on of of concealing devices um, and so all it is is presenting difficulties because you're building on top on a roof so my feeling is that this is just not an appropriate location and we don't have to talk about whether it has their electromagnetic fields or so on, which are not our domain. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments? No, I think that is our finding. Mm -hmm. That the way it's written, it's, that's what is pushing for the proposed location, design, and method of operation of such tower will not have a detrimental effect on the privacy, quiet, light, and air of, of the neighborhood. So what's within our purview is the location and the design. Very tall structure. Well, it's not it's tall is something you would get anyway, but it's bulky. It's, it's bulky. This yeah, bulky. bulky. It's out of it's out of context. It's yeah. just it doesn't fit in. Right. And they made it clear in their submission that the reason why it can't be any easier to look at is because of the location. Right. Because it's you on, need that height. Right. They need that. Well, it's because it's on that roof and and it doesn't doesn't serve the purpose of it would be dangerous to because of wind conditions to make it more uh, easy on the eyes um, they're basically giving us the reason to say this is not an appropriate location then. right because it's not to say that the neighborhood shouldn't have a radio transmitter if it needs one because that's why your cell service or your radio or whatever works then it needs one but it doesn't need to be Thank sitting you. on top of a one-story structure where dunnage beams are the only <coughs> thing holding this thing from falling over and enclosing it in something that is a, attractive, like a, a church steeple that I have a really nice photograph of a church steeple, the super, comp, the super controversial um, water tower that's in Staten Island. Um, you know, those were structures that were built to look like something else and to conceal what, what's really going on behind there, right? And more in line with the character of the community. Yes. And, um, and here it can't be done because of for technical reasons, whereas if it was sitting on the ground, you could pour a foundation, you can do all the things necessary to support the, the, I the they ceiling still need, structure. I thought they still needed that height to be able to go yeah. over the obstruction, so... They, they need the height, but so you build your own tower and create the height. You don't need the roof of another building to create the don't height. Don't they have a parking lot? No. Here? Oh, here. oh behind the... Yeah, yeah, yeah I think they do. And what would happen if they actually built a freestanding structure That's in the I mean. parking lot that went to the same height, but maybe it was slenderer or, right. you know... Yeah. I think that's what it is. It's not that they don't need the height. It's that they're using the height of this building, they're taking advantage of it, and the building can't support any kind of structure that would conceal it or underplay the bulkiness of this thing. Mm -hmm. And by wrapping it in really like paper bag, um, it's making it worse. You didn't like the Gothic yeah. alternative? <laughs> But I mean, you know, I keep looking at this, this really nice, this beautiful church steeple that's uh, online. So it, that's actually probably was inside of an existing church steeple. So there, by the way, there are lots of churches where you might make a deal with a church. Um, <laughs> you know.
know, they naturally have height. So anyway, any anybody else? Any other comments? I, I, I believe for me, it doesn't make difference if they put this on top of a building or the, if they, even if they put it in like a, a lot, freestanding, if they build a freestanding tower by itself. <coughs> for the neighborhood, what I'm going to see at the end if I'm walking around, it's going to be a tower that's probably impacting the character of the neighborhood. I did do some research after I read their engineering report, and I believe there are two solutions that uh, telecommunication companies could do to post the uh, the phone signal. One of them they call it macro solutions, which is this one, something really big, like a tower, they put the antenna and it, it works the radio frequency out. The other solution is they call it micro solution, and it's really small antenna that could be put to uh, let's say a facade of a building it's it's something really small it could be even stuck to like a light pool so if if and instead of this really gigantic tower if they can replace this let's say with five micro pieces like that i believe it would be like a much better approach for them to do and i just want to mention that i did read through their engineering report and i couldn't see that they are saying that things will be really pinky for the radio frequency exposure that the report writer still has some concerns regarding some frequency <coughs> exposures around the antenna that's going to exceed the yes. permissible limits per the FCC requirements and he did mention that in the report in addition that he concluded that the average spatial uh, exposure and and when you start talking about the average he watch out yes. I, I don't want to look at the average i want to look at that like the variation the maximum and probably the minimum and they didn't provide this and and one more thing i'm not sure if the purpose of installing this tower is really to help the neighborhood by improving the signal within the neighborhood or to help other neighborhoods by improving the signal there. If, if the purpose of the second is to enhance the signal outside the neighborhood, just simply go and install it there. Do not install it in neighborhood X while your intention is to improve the signal in Y and Z. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you want to do that, uh, and I believe this is the purpose of installing this thing. So. Right, that's what the applicant has stated because the other signal towers are getting oversaturated and so isn't that the, the other ones are oversaturated, so trying to balance out the uh, demand have on those, they need this tower space. So it's almost kind of helping out. Usually when you submit something like that, you submit the RF diagram, something called the RF diagrams, that show you the current radio, uh, radio frequency intensity. And, and then you submit it before and after. And by comparing these two, you could conclude whether the intention is to enhance the signal locally or globally outside and, and again if it's if it's outside the neighborhood do not penalize this specific neighborhood and go and install it somewhere else mm -hmm. so uh, one of the things that it the engineer report said that was that at um, a distance of four let's see 27 feet above the roof, I think they said, and 40 feet radius um, was where it was exceeding general population limits, right? And then they said, not to worry, nothing's in that. Nobody's going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they didn't show us, uh, we asked them for this. We asked them for a diagram so we could see where is that actually hitting in, in section in an elevation, where is that hitting? Because they said no one's going to be there, but there are workers who work on roofs, right? They well, most the likely roofs. he's talking about at the same level, if this is the antenna, he's talking about this horizontal plan. Yes. And he's talking about on the front, in the direction of the propagation of the wave, mm -hmm. and whatever distance he mentioned in that. Report. Right. But again, he's talking about that mean spiral RF or, or energy something. The mean means that like you take the maximum, the minimum, and you mix right. these together and you come up with a mean number. Oh, we use mean. But the variation itself 
you, you can't see it. it, it the, the maximum number could be 10 times at the mean thing. So if, if you get something like that and you're not sure whether somebody on the next roof is going to be playing, working, you don't know. Right. So why would you put the neighborhood in, in conditions like these? If you want to build this thing to enhance the RF or the phone signal at the adjacent or the one after the adjacent neighborhood, just go there and do it. Mm -hmm. Do not penalize again. Do not penalize this specific neighborhood by installing this tower while you're putting this to serve somebody else. It, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Good. Next. Okay. Item number 26, 2017, 244BZ, 2208 Bowler Avenue. We have a request for adjournment. Yep. New cases, item number one, 2018-12 BZ, 173 North 3rd Street, Brooklyn. Okay, um, this is a legalization. It opened in April 2017. We have proof of service of initial application to officials and of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Many board recommends approval. There are four letters in support, but I noted they were all signed by the same person. <laughs> Um, and notarized, of course, by the same person. Um, we have a June 21st fire department sign off on the sprinklers and fire alarm. We do have DOI on this. The space is sound and vibration isolated. Um, a description of the installation methods is indicated on the plans. Um, and the, um, so I just want to make a, a note to our council that the, there's a sound attenuation set of drawings and a BSA floor plan set. Those should be combined into one set. Um, and that's it. Anybody else? Any other comments? Item number 2, 2018 18 BZ, 2250 Linden Boulevard, Brooklyn. Okay. We have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors, but no proof of initial submission to neighbors and no community board recommendation. Need that huh? immediately. I didn't find any community board yeah. recommendation right. and no proof of initial submission. Um, proof of notice of hearing or the initial? We have the notice of hearing. But we don't have proof of initial submission, and the fact that we have no community board gives me pause. Okay. So um, I thought it was a um, there was a confusing submission on June 21, so just a few days ago, promising to provide materials that were requested in the notice of comments, but then not providing them. So then, the question is, should we hear this? Should we wait? Um, but I reviewed the application because why not? Um, the 1991 resolution had conditions. Uh, I don't know whether the project complies with them. No certificate of occupancy. Not. It does not. Okay. Okay, you can tell us why. It's <laughs> relevant. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I, and I did. I, this is using the Google Street uh, Street View map, and the issue is with the the fence condition, the parking space. It is not being used as a parking space. It is used as a storage space. The parking space has been divided into two parts. There's one part um, that has all the storage, various like trailers, I have the photo here. Yeah. And then the other part, um, which is, um, that, that is where the restaurant is, there's an extension into the rear of the building, which is not shown in the plans. Um, the, the fence is in very poor condition. Street trees are missing. So that's how it's not complied. Oh, that's it. a good start. Okay. Um, it says, also, I'm just reading some of the conditions. It says lighting shall be directed down. Nope. No. 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 Okay. no, there's. I couldn't see any light pole, and since this is not being used as a parking, we don't even know where the light poles are and how it's been used. Um, okay. There's um, a barbed wire fence on top of the building on Cleveland, which is not a plan. So there's lot, just very basic starting point. Not. It's okay. not meeting. It's not and I noted evidence. that there was no compliance certificate yeah. provided. Yeah, that's right because nobody wanted to sign that. Um, it, it seems like the paperwork was very confusing. Yes, yes. very. Unnecessarily so. I mean, it's 
seems like it should be Maybe pretty cut and mm. dry, but. So th this was a, what is um, this is a situation <coughs> where it went, it got calendared before it was, in anticipation of a good response, it got calendared and shouldn't have been, you know. And this is where you think, ah, oh, there's nothing to it. Just respond and, um, and you'll be able to respond. So we'll calendar it and get it on because we look at the submission date versus it was submitted in February, notice of um, comments April got a hearing in June, so, but there was no response. So maybe premature, we can talk <coughs> about whether we even talk about this tomorrow. So um, the board stated that the 19, it, um, the board in the resolution stated that the 1999 edition would be used for storage, which it clearly has been, um, and is not being proposed to do so today. Um, so the applicant should discuss the fact that that was used for storage and is now proposed to be a retail space. Um, they need proof of continuous use since June mm -hmm. 2001. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the plans don't show us where the 630 square foot enlargement is that's referred to in the statement of facts um, that supposedly needs to be legalized. I don't see them anywhere on the drawing. Um, the, uh, there's no actually no difference between right. the drawings submitted right. and the drawings right. that were approved. I'm assuming it's that enlargement that's on that, that you see, that I see, yeah. on, but it's not there in the plan. It's right. Not. Well, there was that previous enlargement in the new one, and there's you right, can't really determine. Uh, the previous the, enlargement was approved, right? right? But on the plans, you it, it you just assume mm -hmm. it looks like they added some space, like a store. But that's it. I don't know how to tell. Yeah. Um, the site is also adjacent to residential buildings, and the prior approvals kept an adjacent area paved and fenced in and free from parking. That was what was supposed to happen. Um, and for me, I didn't go to the site, but the 2014 Google image capture shows that area with a trailer and trash and side walls covered in graffiti. Um, so they need to provide us photographs that show the current state of affairs of all the perimeters um, along the property line and on the street. Um, and um, the images that they provided showed a mix of fencing types and everything in really bad shape. So this is like an unmodeled citizen. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a new, this was taken over. So the prior owner, is the, the current owner is trying to sort of get all the information as to how these changes may have occurred in between them getting the uh, property. So they acquired it. I forget. I don't know how they required it. I don't remember. But uh, so they're gathering some information to one answer the use of discontinuance and how some changes happened that mm -hmm. they were not aware of. Well, Should how changes, the fact that they are changes and the owner's responsible for right. maintaining so, the property, right? Now that he has taken over this property. Should they be providing the mathematical calculations to show that all the added space doesn't exceed the 50% right. from yeah. the previous, yes. the, the pre-61 grant? Which I think or, it would. Is it a pre-61? I think it would or? meet it. I think they would meet it, um, but they, right. they have but to show the calculation. Show the math? Because I agree with you. Yeah. the old extension plus the new extension yes. is less than... 50% right. of what was I think there they actually or? did show that, describe that in their statement of facts because there's one building, I forget which is the A and which is the B, but the building on the left had the extension that was approved in 91. And it was, le it was just less than 50% of that building. And then my understanding is the 650 square feet is being added to the other building, not to the same building the other building right. and so 650 square feet is much less than which is right but usually applicants provide the numbers like right on this lot there was 3,000 square feet they're only no, adding they, they 630 did. Right, and so. then added to the previously added space of 2,000 on this lot, which originally had this amount, the total equals 40% of the yes. existing space, then it's okay. Right. Kind of the same way we ask people with convenience stores on gas stations to justify mm -hmm. yes. the percentage. So, and that little chart was provided in the 99, 91 plans, because mm -hmm. that I have. 
but then they don't they didn't provide right. and the the proposed. right yeah. yeah it's in the narrative but it's not in the drawings right right okay, okay. anybody else on this one I had a very basic question in this one. One of the commercial space um, is vacant, so there is a discontinuance of the use on a, for a portion of the building. How do we treat that? Oh, so this one was something that's a BSA case. It's all or substantially all of the use has to discontinue for them to abandon the use. Okay. Right? I remember back in right. the days. Yeah. <laughs> um, does, does this additional space implicate the parking provided? Camera, please. Should additional spaces be provided or? For the 650 yeah. additional. Interesting. Huh. They have to provide the parking, period. There is no parking right now on this side. <laughs> So in other words, for the 650 square feet added, that they need to add whatever that means in two parking spaces right. or something like that. Or redress it if they don't feel they need to. Right, okay. Okay. Okay, move on. Mm -hmm. Item number three, 2018, 28 BC, 130, 40 Farmers Boulevard, Queens. Okay. CE. Um, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community board recommends approval with two opposed. We have BOI. Um, they should indicate the location of the zoning district boundary line on the first and second floor plans to make clear to this board and future boards that the PCE operations are not being extended into the R3X. Uh, that was one of my concerns. I no, did look at the plan and the entire building footprint is off. Is right. off uh, yeah, but I just want to make sure that on each plan you see that the, sub, the zoning district boundary line is away from the building, right? Is this a legalization? This is new construction. This is new construction. And the issue here was the zoning lot is split by district boundaries. And, and the ground floor of, is parking. And the ground floor is parking. It's below the PC, it's parking. So okay. It's, it's on a stilt. The PC yes. is on a stilt. Oh, okay. And it, but the parking for the PCE doesn't sit in the R3X, right? That's one reason what I really wanted to understand That's, this, because you can't have anything accessory mm -hmm. PCE in the R3X. Because they said they have 47 parking spaces. For I don't the think PCE. the plan clearly showed the parking layout. So, no. and I didn't understand where the building ends. Right when you look at that site plan, you can't tell where the where the cellar, for example, is. Where's the cellar? I don't know. Is that the first floor? Yeah. So the, I think it's only ground floor, and then then the building is on stilts. So that's what I don't know. It's all right. They just need to clarify this yeah, so, so that we don't okay, by so mistake the, yeah. have anything in the R3. So it seems that at least based on the drawing 101, um, the parking area seems to be confined just to the commercial overlay. But I agree with you. Yeah, just, just to show the location so that it's very clear in relation to the lot so about this part here. Yeah. Okay. 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 Other comments? Item number four, 2018-41-BZ, 1238 East 29th Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community Board 14 recommends approval. We have two letters in support. This is a more or less straight line extension at the rear on the first and second floors to, 20, to a 20-foot rear yard. So there isn't a question that there is um, they're, that they're not retaining enough existing building. Um, the site is adjacent to, to one side to a house with a 20-foot rear yard um, at two stories and complying rear yards to the rear and other side. So I'd like um, the architect to attend tomorrow, please, um, and to look at a way to design that is more respectful of those neighbors with the complying rear yards, for example, the, the roof could spring immediately from the second floor 
um, instead of rising to include an attic that only has a little area where you can stand, actually. So, or it's just of official occupiable height. So the spring should just start lower, and that way it'll slope back faster and not be three stories, essentially. Okay, anything else? Item number five, 2017, 131BC, 7785-85, Jerry Street, Brooklyn. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community Board 1 recommends approval with one abstention. We have one letter in support. Um, I'm just trying to understand a little bit of the functions in here. What the difference in function between the prayer rooms on the first floor and the sanctuary on the second floor? And why can't the sanctuary be used for the different prayer services for the, during the day? Um, the programmatic needs chart doesn't break this down adequately to show overlapping occupancies so, so that you see that everything is being used on whichever day it might all it, be used. It doesn't seem like it is being used on a daily basis. No. It's right. They, for, uh, right, just the prayer rooms are for the, the minions, mm -hmm. and it doesn't say anything about the full sanctuary being used on that day, right. on, on those days. It's only on Saturday. and Well, but it'd be one thing if they're used all at once. I in agree which case, with you. right? Yeah. I agree. I mean, I also don't understand why it has to be on the first floor. Because right. I think that kind of implicates the waiver of the rear yard. Because if it was on the, first of all, it's on the first floor and it's got a 14 foot ceiling height for small prayer groups, I'm not right. sure that that's yeah. necessary. But it's full to the lot line, and then the sanctuary has to be full to the lot line on top of it. And if this was switched with the two yeah. sanctuary floors, you could pull back. Yeah, but then the the women's prayer room would have to be right above the. No, I mean you put the sanctuary and the women's prayer room on, on the, one inch, which is typically which what is, we and see. And then the prayer rooms on three, and then we could have a debate on: Do you need s such a large space for each of those prayer rooms? Can you pull it off of the lot line? Right now, right. where it is, you can't have that conversation because you have two floors above it that are full to the lot line. Right. And, and not clear why you need all of those things in the first place. Right. And also, um, I don't know why there's a need for such a um, double height space for the sanctuary, um, because the women's space is set back. So they have, a, and uh, the men's uh, space, uh, the religious space, and sanctuary space, it, it has very high ceiling. It can be much lower, and it would still allow for the sight line. Well, just um, so that's the thing we no, often no, don't see do in with section. The it has nothing right. to do with the sight line. Um, I'm looking through my notes. Um, so the. It has a 13 foot height. Um, it can be lower. It can be lower because at the end of the day, because of the double height of the counting the total height from the second floor all the way to the roof of the third floor, the main sanctuary space will still have significant floor to ceiling height. Mm -hmm. And by reducing that height, you can also reduce the bulk in the rear. And then the prayer room height can also be reduced, which can also further reduce the amount of encroachment in the rear. Mm -hmm. Because if the Typically, the, the sanctuary space needs to have high ceilings because of the proportions of the room, right? So a 13-foot high ceiling under the mezzanine level is a there normal... Is no mezzanine. The, well, the, the mezzanine of the women's prayer space. It func if functionally, it's a mezzanine right. because it looks down into... I'm sorry, the I'm not explaining it thoroughly. The, the total height is much more than... Um, I, oh, I think that's because it's missing that level. It's not showing the no, women's no, no, prayer. No, no. I, I need to blow. Sorry. Okay. Just give me a second. Let me show you the plan, what I mean by that. And, um, where is that? Where is that? I mean to tell you the number. 2017131, right? Okay. So I, I just gave the 13-foot height as the height that's in the front of the building, not in the back of the building. So just... Tell 
total of 22 feet, seven or nine inches. Okay. Between both? For the second and sides. third floor, right. for both floors. That, that's, I don't think of that as abnor abnormal height right. because the be. sanctuary where the altar is and all of that always has this very high level in, in all prayer spaces, right? When you have a mezzanine level that counts on the line of sight to be able to see the altar. Otherwise, if you reduce the height, well, either you don't get the line of sight or it, it's a very, very constricted mm -hmm. we have space. Seen, we have seen um, layouts of the spaces where almost there isn't a line of sight. As, but there as should much. be a line of sight. Why wouldn't you want a line of sight? No, I'm, I'm comparing it to some of the other um, sample. We have almost always seen a line of sight. I've very rarely actually seen a complete women's floor with just a hole in the floor. But we, we, when it's a mezzanine, there almost, is a line right. of sight. Yeah. What's the section look like? Anyway, okay, so that something that the applicant can, I think they're missing the mezzanine level in that picture. That's, yeah, they are. Yeah, so that's the thing is the mezzanine is here. This, th there's a, a mistake on the section mm -hmm. that's missing the floor, the women's floor. That, that's the issue. Right. Um, so then I just wanted to say, well, my, my main concern about these kinds of things has to do with the extra height at the rear on the residential neighbors that face it. Um, so the applicant really needs to talk about that issue and how they're impacting those neighbors to the rear. Um, um, but I do note that those buildings that are facing back to back have these really, really deep balconies that are projecting into their own rear yard, so they've effectively reduced their rear yard experience with that. So that should be a discussion. And then um, I just want to note from Environmental, we have a March 7th OER Notice of Satisfaction letter based on the site's e-designation for hazmat and air quality. Any other comments on this? There one? are some basic uh, <coughs> mistakes between the zoning chart and the plans um, in terms of the base heights that has been stated for R7A and the maximum building heights and the FAR. So those all need to be coordinated. Same thing with the narratives. They all need to be consistent. Anything else? Um, they just need to talk about the um, the occupancies on the plans and because it seems like they may be providing for a lot more uh, space for more congregants than currently is there. It could be one of those things where the DOB requires a certain amount of space and it doesn't really reflect what is going to be needed, but they should just talk about that. I do have one question and that is um, where the setback happens, where the residential floor starts, the setback in the plans is, a set, is shown as five foot deep, whereas it should be 15 foot. So unless that's an additional waiver that is being requested. It, the setback of the residential floor is only yeah, five feet. Five feet. So, so um, this is not an application for I any know. waivers from the residential, so it so has to comply. It has to comply, so. Is that the rear you're looking at? No, the front. Oh, that's the front, the front set, setback. setback okay. has to be 15 feet from the street line. Did you, what section, did you notice the section? Oh, okay. I, that's, okay, I thought if you'd written it, okay. So the applicant needs to verify if they're wrong, they're going to need to modify the drawings because this, yeah. this is not qualifying for any kind of waivers for the residential. Right. Okay. Anybody else on this? Okay. Item number 6, 2017-298-BZ, 14 White Street. We have proof of service of initial application to officials and a no notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community Board 1 recommends denial with 20 to deny, 5 to approve, 2 abstaining. Reasons weren't given in the resolution, but our project manager called um, the, the Community Board um, who stated that um, uh, they have a concern about overdevelopment. I didn't really understand that as a rationale. Perhaps the applicant can speak to what occurred at the hearing. Um, with respect to the A finding, 
I see this is a triangular site near a subway tunnel. Um, but other than some possible additional costs associated with the subway tunnel, I, didn't, I don't see that these conditions are imposing much of a hardship on development. The as of right project rises without setback to six stories, allows for full use of all of the FAR, and creates luxurious apartments. A lot of as of right projects don't get to use all their floor area, all right? Uh, the street wall height and setback regulations don't seem to be preventing development of a viable project. So, so really, this hinges on whatever it is. The really? subway. Excuse us. What just happened? Sorry. Should we continue? Uh, I just wait for a second. Okay. Holding off. Yeah. Something might not be working. Yeah, they're preparing for their, their hearing, and unfortunately, they dropped something. Oh, okay. All right, continuing. So, um, as I was saying, so the as of right seems to be not imposing, the as of right seems to be a viable project in terms of the look of the project. So, everything seems to be hinging on what kind of hardships the subway tunnel might be imposing, which I'll just let Commissioner Shea talk about. Um, the, some of the hardships that are described um, are a disproportionate ratio of facade to floor plate, but I, I didn't see that described in any way um, as yeah. being an issue. Um, and um, actually, from a marketing perspective, doesn't more window wall help um, make the units more desirable since they have better natural lighting <coughs> and fewer wasted interior core areas. Sometimes you have a site that's too fat and too much interior core and so, you know, you don't have good lighting in the bedrooms and so on. Um, plus there's a one million dollar cost increase between the facades of the as of right and the proposed. So actually um, the proposed configuration is increasing facade costs as opposed to kind of mitigating the project with the, by the facade. Um, the automated parking system, I have a very big problem with that, um, is, is first of all costly, I think probably underestimated in the cost estimates in terms of what it really costs the project to put this in. It's not just buying the automated system, it's also the structural framing that's needed for it and, and everything else. Um, um, it, and I think that none of it should figure in as an essential construction element. Um, it seems to be driving the desire for this variance, actually. The mechanism is very large and really disturbs the integrity of the retail space and of the second floor apartment, um, lowering both of their values. It chops it up into these kind of very strange shapes. Um, I, I actually think it would lower the value of the third floor unit as well, since now you're located over a parking garage. and. Um, and not to mention living next door on the second floor to the mechanism, like what kind of walls do you have to build, what kind of insulation do you have to have to still not hear this thing churning around at three in the morning when somebody comes home late, right? Um, I really, I actually think the parking garage should be eliminated from the discussion entirely and the plans revised to leave it out. Uh, if the developer chooses afterwards to add it as a luxury, that's their choice, but it shouldn't be driving our analysis. Um, furthermore, one of the stated hardships is the size of the required core relative to the floor plate, and yet they insert this parking system into it, which is much more disruptive to the layout than the core is, which is relatively um, discreet, actually. Um, with respect to the setback waivers, the renderings provided that I assume were provided to the Landmarks Commission don't show setback levels on the upper floors, only on the second floor of the retail. Um, I also don't understand the curb cut waiver. Um, there is no difference in location between the parking mechanism and plan. 
um, between the conforming and the lesser variance versions and no noticeable improvement in plan for the proposed version. Um, and is the parking area on the second floor being taken as a floor area deduction because it needs to be below 23 feet above curb and it's actually to the roof, to the underside of the second floor I think is more than 23 feet above curb so I'm not really sure how that actually works with DOB. Um, our project manager reached out to the Department of Transportation with respect to the proposed curb cut that is less than 50 feet from the intersection, but we didn't get a response. Um, with respect to the unit mix comparisons, there are no one bedrooms in the as of right, so it's not comparing apples to apples. And the, uh, you know, and that goes to, again, this parking mm -hmm insertion, it's forcing the second floor of the proposed and the lesser to have these two one bedrooms, um, which are arguably not more desirable in the marketplace than a two bedroom or a more luxurious apartment. Um, and so we need more info on the greater desirability of those one bedroom units um, over a two or three bedroom unit in a very high end market building. Um, the parking sales comps are also skewed by old data. Um, I get $415,000 of space if you use only 2014 and later data. Um, there's also drywall and several other line items that are lower in the lesser variance than in the as of right when the unit counts and full bath counts are the same with these two projects. And um, why doesn't the as of right get fireplaces? So, um, and why are there fireplaces at all in the analysis, even though they're not very expensive, which I was surprised to learn. Everyone should have a fireplace in New York City. So, <laughs> okay, so anybody else? I just want to add to it, I completely agree with you with regards to the automated car parking. I mean, how it has been justified and the need for it and the cost associated with it, it's absolutely something that I agree with. I'm not going to de detail on that. I had just some basic questions, which is um, typically when you have a um, unique site, and um, don't we also do a typical site? And in this case, a typical analysis was not done. In, uh, instead, a lesser variance was done, which to me, I'm not sure why that was driven. Um, when we typically look for the typical and then work on Well, the, the lesser is often anticipating that we're not going to be okay with a 1 FAR increase, which is not a bad But assumption. still we need a typical. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, kind of actually they, they did look into a, a typical site, but just with respect to the foundation ah. part. So they submitted to us so without, it's only without, the structural without any analysis plans. And just other just a, a cost comparison between a typical site and the proposal or the as as built or the, con the actual conditions with respect to just the foundation uh, cost and the other elements okay. that because relates that to is the, the driving part of this each other. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay. Say, sorry say that one last line again they, they submitted a cost comparison between what they call the typical conditions and actual conditions but this cost comparison was just related to the cost items that pertains to the hardship coming mm -hmm. from the subway park. Okay. okay. That's that was like a table. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would ask for it. So yes, it's I a foundation it cost compact. That's what it says. The other question was since in this uh, special district bike parking is not required, I'm not sure why in the as of right bike parking is being proposed in the cellar when um, by relocating the res residential storage they could allow for more commercial storage in the cellar and that could help in the financing so that's another thing they should look at. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. I feel that the um, the parking is actually contributing to the hardship. It's very expensive to install that kind of parking. The parking is not required, and it's also impacting the floor plates. And you've already got floor plates that are constrained due to the shape of the lot. You don't need to constrain them further by cutting out a large square away from the retail as well as away from the apartments. Mm -hmm. And I also agree with you as to what it would be like to live either next door to the parking 
parking machinery or above it because there's got to be noise and vibrations and so to isolate the parking from the residential is probably expensive and for something an item that is not required I don't think it needs to be in this analysis at all I also agree with you that the comparables for the parking leases are actually dragging the lease rate down or the uh, sales rate down it should be around five hundred thousand uh, dollars space we've seen that on other cases in this area and in fact one of the comps that come from Tribeca is actually at five hundred thousand a space and that was a couple of years old so it might even be more now so I think certainly that should be um, taken out of this analysis um, I have other financial comparables uh, financial comments sorry the hour is late I'm getting tired <laughs> site value none of the comparables have the zoning listed so I'm not sure if they're apples to apples comparisons and there are no adjustments to sales comparisons at all this is a new financial analyst so just saying just a range of sales of various sizes with the allowable zoning floor area listed and the transaction date and a map and that's all we have you have to do the math for everything else residential sales um, there are no amenities listed on any apartments, no explanation as to the comparability and no adjustments to the comparables other than the amount of the bedrooms are the same for each group of, comparison, of, of um, comparables. The outdoor space was given a value of 30% of the interior space, but only for the four, five, first 500 square feet of outdoor space in any apartment. So that actually has an effect on the penthouse apartments because the penthouse apartments have more outdoor space. They have double the outdoor space and the value is not being accounted for. Um, the construction costs, I, I will defer to Commissioner Shetta, but I do have a question. How much of the costs which are high are being driven by the parking garage and not by the adjacency to the subway the soft costs are very high they're at least 50 percent of the hard costs and to me there are an awful lot of fees that i've never seen before um, for instance uh, for the pro there's project legal fees there's zoning legal fees there's bsa legal fees and there's landmarks legal fees the legal <laughs> fees are like three times what we've ever seen before and so i'm directing the applicant to look at other um, financial reports that actually are on record at the bsa for an idea of what we actually accept in appropriate soft costs um, I did talk about the parking leases, and that's all I have for now. Okay. Okay. So, g generally speaking, the, regarding the cost estimate, it doesn't it doesn't uh, satisfy the requirements that we submitted. So that in our administrative notice, yes. you mean? So we we still have no details of any cost items, like like for example the. Pile foundation, linear footage is 1,924, and for rock socketing is 370. Just two numbers like that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this applies to all the cost items included in the cost test. Now, regarding the, uh, how we get to like quantifying this hardship or the variance, we, we previously indicated that, that, that procedure to do that is to consider two sites, one of them is typical, without the source of the hardship, which is mainly, according to my understanding, is the subway tunnel. And the other side is the actual site. And then run the mass, run, do the drawings, the foundation plan, the excavation support, the underbidding, whatever. And then get the cost for the foundation for that site, the typical site without that TA in the view. And then do the same thing with the TA in consideration, and then get the difference, and the difference between the two posts, this is your hardship. Let's, let's say you got 100,000 difference. Then take this and see how much is that out of the as of right. Mm -hmm. And let's say this is 5%. Now we have guidance that you get 5% hardship. So we're going to think or consider granting you 5% of 5, 5.5, five 4.5, but at least we have guidance towards what we call it the lesser values. Mm -hmm. So this, this should be the procedure. What was done is, is I, I got a cost table like that with comparison between the uh, 
typical and the actual. And I got no drawings whatsoever for what's called typical site. And I'll go over the cost items one by one. I have drilled caissons. Caissons are some sort of pile foundation, deep foundation. And I would say caissons are the most expensive pile foundation that could be used. So I'm not sure if using caissons on that project is the way to go. I believe it could be some sort of much cheaper pile foundation like micro piles. I'm, I'm, I'm took, I know that the language I'm talking right now is kind of engineering language, but I'm sure that the geotechnical engineer, when he listens to this, mm -hmm. he will get what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, I got sheeting and shoring, and I got something called sheeting and shoring MTA and shearing and shoring standard. And I'm not sure why would the shearing and shoring be different. At, at the end of the day, you're supporting the excavation. So did the MTA ask for a specific design to be adapted? If yes, please submit to us these drawings and, and, and convince us why you want to differentiate between the typical and the actual with respect to the uh, excavation support. General excavation, more or less they are the same. Uh, rock fill foundation walls, pumping. I did read in the geotechnical report, regarding the pumping or the dewatering, I have seen one lump sum item, and the cost for this lump sum item is $150,000 to perform dewatering. If you go to the geotechnical report that was prepared by, by their own geotechnical engineer, in his report, he says this, we anticipate that no special groundwater control measures during or after construction will be required for mass excavation. So if your geotechnical engineer is saying no special groundwater control is needed, how come you're incorporating $150,000 dewatering in your course? It doesn't make sense. Uh, wall footings, column footings. Now, they look at the, uh, the typical conditions as if they need just footings, spread footings. And they look at the, the typical conditions, sorry, the actual conditions as they need pile foundation. I did look at the geotechnical report and the subsurface conditions, and I believe that this, this area is close to Canal Street, and, and probably most of the geotechnical engineers who handle jobs in, in New York, especially in Manhattan, they know that the area around Canal Street has soft soils, they have, it has silty material, it has, it has problematic subsurface conditions. I'm not talking about the subway. So if you want to convince me that for the typical condition, you just needed spread footings, isolated foundation, which the cost for which is kind of nothing compared to the pile foundation. Submit to me recommendations for the typical conditions, not considering the, the subway tunnel and design a foundation plan and submit it to us. Convince us that you really needed just isolated footings. Right now, I'm not convinced. Uh, the next item is the, in, in that cost estimate, they consider mad slab, mad foundation like usual. And in addition to this, they consider four inch slab of grade and waterproof slab. So I'm not sure why mad foundation and then another four inch thick slab and with gravel layer in between. That's, that's too much. And, and regarding the mat foundation, if you're using pile foundation, you just need tiny pile caps. And if you wanna, if you're talking about the groundwater and you wanna waterproof the, the basement, I would say just put your foundation slab, put your slab on grade, put it high enough, right at the groundwater table. So you don't need to like put some, some sort of a pressure slab or thick slab to accommodate for the hydrostatic pressure. And I, I, I looked at the section actually on drawing Z-115. And if you look at how deep is the finished floor, and, and there is contra contradiction in that section. If you look to the left to where the elevations are, 
it's almost 11 feet below the street level. Why do you need to put the ground, the finished floor from the basement that deep? If you're not looking for problems, I would put it 10 feet. So you eliminate the hydrostatic pressure at all because according to the geotechnical report, the groundwater table is 13 feet below the sidewalk. If it's 13 feet and you don't want to play the risk with the groundwater and, and minimize the cost, just put this finished floor immediately above the groundwater, the designed groundwater, which I understand the geotechnical engineer said it should be considered three feet above whatever was monitored in the world. So the geotechnical engineer in his report actually accounted for a safety caution, which is three feet. They saw the groundwater here. The guy said design for three feet above. So if, if you want to save the mat slab and you want to save the headache from the pressure slab, just put the finished floor for the basement at that elevation, at the design groundwater level or elevation. So you eliminate the need for, uh, for the mat slab. Uh, regarding the piles, again, I, as I indicated, micro piles would be like much cheaper uh, element. And, and, and then, like, like Commissioner Atlan mentioned, there are some items that I couldn't understand why they are there or even what are these, like vibration isolation, mm -hmm. 500,000, half a million, vibration isolation, what is that? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I have designed and constructed a 65-story building, three feet away of three lines, subway lines, not just one, three. And I never accounted for something like that. And even the pile, we didn't, we didn't design pile foundation for the entire project. We designed pile foundation just for the portion that's adjacent to the tunnel. I understand this site could be like smaller, but still, if, if you want to even design the entire site on pile foundation, consider a cheaper pile that I don't believe that case on type is the type to adapt here. Uh, MTA engineering, 75,000. I'm not sure what is MTA engineering. As far as I understand, when you submit the excavation support to the MTA to review them, you have to pay $150 check in order for them to look at this. Maybe it's hiring the engineers who specialize in TA, MTA work. It, this is already included oh, in the soft coast. Okay, so, so maybe then it, that's... It's something the related to the MTA and it's 75,000. Mm -hmm. I would like to understand what is that. So it Any, may be that that's being picked up by the cost estimator, but also by the financial analyst. And so we're getting two of the same fees. Problem. Right, okay. The problem. And then there's MTA seismic monitoring. Uh, seismic monitoring is during earthquakes. It, are you talking about vibration monitoring? 300,000 for that? I, I don't think so. The entire vibration monitoring for the entire site, from the day you break the ground to the day you finish the foundation, is not going to be this. This is huge. And, and this has nothing to do with the, the adjacency to the subway tunnel. If, if you are adjacent to, let's say, a, la a landmark or even a regular building, you would need to like monitor the vibrations during construction. So I don't know why this is here. Uh, underpinning. Again, I have no drawings for the existing buildings around the site. So I cannot tell whether the underpinning cost is legit or not. Please give us a survey for the existing conditions for the adjacent buildings so we can look at, at them and evaluate the need for underpinning and same thing for the excavation support we need plans we're not i'm not going to take numbers without plans and drawings and if i believe these plans or drawings are exaggerated i'm i'm going to question their their legitimacy from from the technical standpoint we need to wrap up because yeah. we sure. need to hand over sure. the, so the rest you'll pick up with the they'll bring their engineer and their cost estimator to the hearing so that you can have direct conversation with them okay okay um and that way we can um yeah somebody who can listen and you can respond and, and like i said for the for the cross sections if you look at the sections there are some contradiction between the dimensions on the elevation bar and the dimensions on the section itself so they need to fix that okay okay okay
All right. Um, Commissioner uh, Shibeta, did you have comments? I, it, my biggest comment is I just they named the triangle shape as some reason for uniqueness. I didn't see the hardship in it. Um, and it seem, I, I, I agree with the chair. It seems that the parking is what's driving this variance. Um, because as of right, I just don't see where where their hardship is. To I, I, it seems like the parking is going to be their greatest hardship. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. This concludes the Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for June twenty fifth, two thousand eighteen.